Okay, um, let's call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, February 26th to order. If I could ask everyone to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Flags up here. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, roll call, please. Batson. Pat Grudy? Here. Kevin Huber? Here. Scott Luce? Karen Lundstedt? Here. Ellen Maurer? Here. Mac Thurman? Here. Okay, so we know Jim Batson and Scott Luce absent for the record. Okay, our agenda today, um, we'll open it up for public comment. I'll ask that anybody speaking tonight, um, please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to three minutes, please. Um, we've got some really good educational presentations. We've got some student recognition tonight and then um, presentations on our concussion protocol and school safety. Um, so I would highly encourage people to stay for those. Uh, we'll have updates from our student school board reps, a superintendent's report. Uh, we'll approve the consent vote agenda, which was reviewed <coughs> earlier this month in committee. And then brief updates from program and personnel and facilities and finance. Uh, there is nothing from property. Anything from CEDAW? Just the WPRC. Okay. Um, and ISB, nothing tonight. And then there's an executive session. Um, but we will not be doing part A, employment of employee. Correct. Um, correct, right? All right. And so we will only discuss collective negotiating matters. It's 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C2, and we won't plan to take any action tonight after that session. All right? Anything else? <coughs> All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin this evening, we want to um, take a moment of silence and recognition of the 17 victims at Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. So please join me in a mo moment of silence. Thank you. Pat? Okay, thank you. All right, so let's start off with our student recognition for the night. Who's going to go first? Dr. Clintis? Yep. Ah. Okay. Oh, my, okay, yeah, sorry. Is there anybody from the public who'd like to speak? Yes. <laughs> Good. All right. See, I knew that. Besi besides Tom. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Student recognition. I would definitely speak public comments, but with only three minutes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you I'll never work need, for you, Tom. I need more time. <laughs> All right, well, I'm uh, Tom Clennis, principal of Libertyville High School and I'm very uh, delighted tonight to present to you some extraordinary Libertyville Wildcat athletes. Um, so we're gonna start it off with our first one and uh, I'm gonna ask Amanda Peter to come up. Is Amanda here? There she is. So Amanda is an all-state goalie in ice hockey and she plays for the Scouts Girls Hockey Association and this is a combined team of um, Libertyville High School, Lake Forest High School, Stevenson High School, and Highland Park and Deerfield, correct? And you guys play in the Metro Girls Hockey Division, which is in the Scholastic Division. So for those of you that don't know hockey, this means that she is competing against the best high school teams in the state of Illinois. And she has earned all state honors as a goalie. She's a junior. And the Blackhawks could have used you this year when Corey Crawford <laughs> went down. So, um, and I'm sure you had a, a great time watching the USA uh, Women's Olympics team capture gold. Maybe we'll see you there one day in the future. Mm -hmm. I have a certificate for you. And so we are super proud of you. And um, just so you know, I play goalie in our staff floor hockey league. And um, <laughs> they would trade you uh, for me very, very quickly. Sure. Like they would, they, oh, I know you would have a team definitely uh, willing. They would send me to the bench in a second. So <laughs> congratulations. Dad, you're 
You're welcome to yeah, come, come over and take a picture if you'd like. Our next student athlete that we are going to talk about is, uh, I'm going to bring up somebody who's uh, brand new to the Libertyville High School community, Mr. Dale Eggert. I think he's been here for about a week or so. He's going to talk about uh, one of our wrestlers, Danny Pacino. It is with great pleasure to bring up Danny Pacino, our recent All-State uh, wrestler, 132, uh, 132 pounds, finished the season at 44 and three, and um, not only did he uh, take third in the, in the state, which is quite an accomplishment, but he happens to be our first sophomore that's ever received All-State honors for Liberty for Wrestling. Got two more years of this guy. Uh, doesn't just win, he also does it uh, in a very entertaining way, which I think if you all saw him, you know what I'm talking about. So congratulations, Dan. <laughs> So in addition to being a floor hockey goalie, I was a wrestler. And uh, where Danny is 44 and three, I think my record senior year was three and 44. So, you know, we're kind of mirror images of each other. But the other thing I want to say about Danny is not only is he, um, uh, you think about the storied history of Libertyville High School wrestling, the first sophomore to win all state honors is, is remarkable. But also he is, um, uh, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, but he is an honor roll student for us. Um, earning that, uh, so he gets after it in the classroom. And um, the one thing, I'm a new principal here, and this is like the friendliest guy. You think of wrestlers being kind of intimidating, walking around maybe, you know, trying to be, act like a tough guy. This is like the, one of the nicest guys. If, if I had to pick an ambassador for the school to be a, like a welcome party, it would be him because he's always smiling, always talking. Like one of the first days of school, I didn't even know him, and he was already talking to me and telling me all about the school. So thank you for the way you represent us. Okay, I, uh, I'm going to keep it rolling with some more Wildcats. And so, um, is uh, Tom here, Bozowski? All right, come on up, Tom. And is Bill here tonight, Etnire, or no? No, just, okay, so Tom, come on up. And if, uh, Stuart, would you come on up too? So, um, every single year, the IHSA asks its 400 member schools to make nominations for the Illinois um, IHSA, Illinois um, Athletic Association, what they call the All-State Academic Honors. And each school is allowed to nominate um, two athletes, okay? So out of 400 schools, there's about 800 students nominated for this award. And only 26 students are selected in the entire state of Illinois. So out of that 800 nominations, only 26 students get nominated or get selected for all state honors. Most schools are ecstatic if they have one of their nominees selected. Um, Libertyville High School this year had both of our nominees selected. So these are the top two of 26 uh, student athletes in the state. And we're gonna hear tonight, um, we're also very proud that our sister school, Vernon Hills, has an all-state academic athlete as well. So in the entire state of Illinois, 800 nominees, three of them, three of the 26 are right here in District 128. So that's an extraordinary district accomplishment. And um, we are gonna bring up uh, the two Libertyville Wildcats right now. Um, both of them are runners, so I don't know what that tells us here. But let's bring up Melissa Manich, please. Is Melissa here? There she is. And Alex Tan. And I'll let you as coaches talk about these extraordinary scholar athletes. All right, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of Melissa. 
Um, in regards to Melissa's athletic ability, she has been a staple over the last four years, not only to the girls' track program, but also to the girls' cross-country program. She is currently a captain for my program and has been nominated by her peers in previous seasons as well. She has been a state qualifier multiple times and has been an All-State Award winner in both cross-country and track and field. Coach Reifenberg, who is Melissa's distance coach, had this to say. Melissa is a talented and dedicated runner who embodies good sportsmanship. Melissa has always been a phenomenal runner. She has extreme determination and grit to continually succeed on the track and course, exemplified by her extreme, impressive personal best times and her all-state recognitions in both sports. Over the past two years, she has grown into a tenacious runner who has no fear, knowing that she can compete against anyone in the state. Additionally, Melissa shows her determination every day. Every workout, she has a smile on her face, and I cannot recall a time that she has complained. She enjoys hard work, she enjoys the journey of training, and she is always asking to do more mileage, more repetitions, and to run faster times. She is highly motivated to succeed and to celebrate her love of the sport. Additionally, Melissa is a strong leader on our team. She takes time to reach out to other athletes who are on the team and gives them positive support. She holds herself to an extremely high standard, not just in her running, but in every aspect of her life, something I know the other athletes recognize and appreciate. Melissa is someone that I have an immense amount of respect for. I respect her judgment and I respect her opinions. I view her as an extremely mature, well-rounded, determined individual. When I think of Melissa, I think of a person who is going to be successful in whatever she puts her mind to. She is truly a go-getter who is ambitious and caring. Her qualities will help any team, both on and off the field. Her grade point average speaks for itself, but she doesn't just perform well to earn grades. She is genuinely interested in learning, exemplified by her mid-running <coughs> conversations about solving global problems and asking to practice her tra <laughs> trombone during the preliminary heats at the IHSA state track meet. Uh, I could go on, but I, I think that last statement pretty much said that. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, uh, it's great pleasure that I have this opportunity to present Melissa with a certificate from the Board of Education tonight, honoring her as one of the select all-state, all-academic athletic recipients from the IHSA. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, a few months ago, I was here to uh, recognize Alex for his all-state athleticism. Tonight we recognize both his athleticism and his academia, which is even more important. Um, I had a written speech before, but I'm just going to mention highlights. Uh, Alex has set the record in the mile for track and field. He continues to break that uh, this year, and he also wants to break the other distance records in the half mile and the two mile. Alex has ran the second fastest all-time of all Libertyville athletes for cross country. He has also ran the fastest time on our cross country course. Um, other highlights, his citizenship and uh, academia has made him team captain for cross country and track and field and also carries a 4.5 GPA out of 4.0. Um, Alex is well-rounded and he also plans on continuing his athleticism and academia at the School of Miami University of Ohio. So tonight I'd like to present this award to Alex Tam. Okay, good evening. I'm John Gilliam, uh, principal of Vernon Hills, and uh, happy to be here in front of you. We too have an IHSA um, all state academic um, athlete, student athlete. So, Jordan, why don't you come on up? Don, come on up. Uh, Jordan Bunning is uh, this year's recipient, uh, and 
Dr. Clintus did a great job of kind of explaining that award, so I won't. But I will say this. Um, Vernon Hills, in its short, what, 17 years, has had uh, a total of seven of these uh, award winners, which is remarkable. It's remarkable, like Tom said, that we have three out of our district, uh, but Jordan is the seventh of Vernon Hills High School, and we are super proud uh, to have her tonight. So Don Proft is one of her coaches, and he's going to speak a little bit on her behalf. Uh, thank you. First of all, we'll start with uh, athletically. She, uh, Jordan, has seven state medals from our three state track meets, which is a, a crazy amount. <coughs> uh, saying that, her, her uh, class rigor and the classes she takes, her test scores are equally amazing. But what I'd rather spend our time talking about is the leader and teammate that she is. She is just a natural born leader on our team. She knows everybody on our team and makes all of the new athletes feel really welcomed, uh, knows them all by name, leads them. And, and as a hurdler, she is another coach and she's uh, constantly um, convincing people that they should try the hurdles. The hurdles <laughs> are not, not an easy sport to uh, do well at. And it's just, it's amazing to watch other kids in our program uh, run with Jordan and do things with her and practice with her and not, they're not intimidated by all the success that she's had. In fact, they ask questions and want to be a part of and want to learn about why uh, she does so well. So Jordan, congratulations on this achievement. To continue, uh, we've, had, we've had several students recognized for their athletic accomplishments tonight, but now we move into the fine and performing arts side of it uh, at our place, at Vernon Hills. And uh, anyone who's been around our school uh, for any amount of time just understands the uh, tremendous level at which our kids <coughs> perform in the fine and performing arts. Now, I wasn't going to do this, but since Dr. Clint has said that he wrestles and plays hockey. <laughs> um, oh boy. And I'd like to see Danny and him wrestle after the meeting tonight. I would just I'd like to see that. I have some chops in, in fine performing arts also. As witnessed by this year, they allowed me to be in the musical. And I had 24 words. And I nailed every one of them. Uh, but I, I have no skill in compared to the kids that are going to come up here uh, in just a little bit. So I'm going to invite Drew Russell, who's our uh, fine and performing arts department supervisor, come up here and share a little bit about these uh, awards. So the thing to know about John's role in the play, he actually started with ah line, a single word, and that's how much confidence they had in him. Uh, however, he so overperformed it that they expanded his role significantly. Also, see, look, at he doesn't like this. It's all good. Hey, this is my mic right now, John. So uh, also, yeah. Also, he, I believe you were a framer at one point, right, for artwork? Look at that, little known fact about Mr. Gillian, an artist. All right, first I'm going to talk about the Allstate musicians that we have. I've got to tell you, much like uh, the award that Tom announced, schools are lucky to have a uh, Allstate musician, maybe two, and we are really, really lucky, and this is one of my favorite nights of the year, uh, because it really it shows the culmination of efforts by our staff, by the really talented students, but also their parents who spend a whole lot of time, money, and car mileage on getting their children all to all of the different lessons and events and fine arts activities that happen all around the greater Chicago land or greater Midwestern area. So this is really a culmination of all those efforts and we get to show just how lucky we are and how good a bunch of kids make us look. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call up first our all state musicians. And so just for reference, our all state musicians are first selected for all district. What that means is they're in the top 10% of students in our general region. 
Uh, if you draw a line from Nutria High School up to Harvard, Illinois, that corner of Illinois, they're in the top 10% of those students. Then from there, the top 10% of those kids make it to all state. So I think that's the top 1% of the state. I'm a fine arts guy, I can do that. So anyway, these guys are really good. So I'm gonna call them up and you all come up when I call your name and I will meet you later to pass out the certificates. And we will start with Bobby Black, who's a tuba player. And he's an all-state musician. Come on up, Bobby. He's also a vocalist and a bass player and a piano player. He can do anything. And Donna Lee Black, for voice. Jillian Bowes, also for voice. Kaylee Brand, for voice. Kelsey Carrito voice. Ariel Cha for violin. I do not believe she's here this evening. Cece Gao, flute. Josh Liu, alto saxophone. Nikki Madonovich, who was an all-stater on piccolo, but she also made district on voice and probably would have been an all-state for that too, but she had to choose, and of course she chose band. <laughs> So one, one more announcement while we have these students up here. There's also an all-nation ensemble that I actually didn't know existed, but Jillian Bowes taught me all about it because she uh, submitted a online audition and was selected to the National Association for Music Education All-National Honor Ensemble. So I'd like to see if they could come up with some more words for that ensemble. Congrats, Jillian. All right. Next up, we had a number of students who were selected to be a part of the All-State production, which this year was Big Fish, which was the movie, uh, the musical that they, they made from the movie circa 2004. And the, basically the All-State production, they select 40 students for the pit, 40 students for the cast, 40 students for the crew from the entire state, and we had a large number, again, of students involved in that production. Also, by the way, John plays a little guitar. All right, same thing for the All-State Theater students. Come on up. Donna Lee Black, coming back. Second time, multi-talented. Mackenzie Furlet. Samantha Colbert. Sophia Schmelzer. Valerie Smith. And Skylar Torrey. Listen, before we go, uh, those of you who have been here before, I will tell you this is um, the favorite thing, our favorite thing to do, uh, is to recognize students uh, wherever and whenever uh, they achieve and uh, they go higher and beyond, uh, whatever that is. So uh, I want to take a minute tonight again and recognize <coughs> around all these young people are family and friends. 
and neighbors and uh, support groups that have helped these young people get where they're at and accomplish what they've accomplished. So if uh, all the parents and any friends or family members that are here tonight, I would like you to stand up and let us recognize you for your great work in working with your young people. Come on. Now, normally at this point, I say something like, you know you're not required to, but you can stay for the rest of the board meeting if you want, okay? Or you could exit stage left or right, depending on where we're at. Um, and normally everybody leaves, which is okay, that's all right. Um, tonight we have two uh, presentations that Dr. Gurdy uh, mentioned earlier that really are timely and significant, and if you have some time uh, and you would like to stay, we'd love to have you stay. Uh, the first presentation uh, will be introduced by uh, Brian Kelly in just a minute, and that's on our concussion protocol. And the second presentation is the work that uh, we've done and we continue to do in school safety and security. Okay, so with that said, if you have to leave, we get it. If you want to stay, you can certainly report either, uh, either or both of those topics. So thanks again, and thanks for coming. Okay. <laughs> For our first presentation, I'd like to introduce um, Cam Trout. She's our school nurse from Libertyville High School, and she's going to present uh, concussion management at Libertyville High School, which really involves two pieces. Um, I don't want to steal all of our thunder, but really the return to learn portion of concussion management for our students and also the return to play for our student athletes. So I, this time, I'm going to turn it over to Cam Trout. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, my, my little disclaimer is that even the school nurse gets a little sick from time to time. So I have a little bit of a head cold, so I have my tea here. And I kind of know what it feels like a little bit. Every time I get a good, good, solid head cold, I kind of know that foggy feeling that some of our students experience with a concussion. So speaking from experience, it's not fun. <laughs> so bear with me as I, as I uh, share our story here at Libertyville High School. And I also wanted to start by just thanking the staff, thanking the district, the staff here at LHS. You know, without their support, it's a team. This is a team thing that we're doing here. Um, it is definitely not a one-person show. So on behalf of those that I do this with, I want to say thanks for your support in helping us do what we do and taking care of our kids every day. So um, to get going, because I know you guys have got a lot going on, I'm going to move us along here. The first couple of slides I'm going to buzz right through. Um, I know you're going to get the presentation after I'm done, so you have some opportunities to read through a little bit more if you're really interested in concussions like I am. Um, and I am more than happy to answer any questions too as we go. <coughs> Just suffice it to say that there are at least four laws out there in the state of Illinois alone on concussion management and care. So as you all know, we are dictated a lot by what we do, by the, the laws and the policies. So not just evidence-based practice, but the laws that we have to make sure that we're adhering to every day. And then I've got some information about prevalence from a national standpoint. And good old definitions of a concussion. These are the two resources that I would highly recommend. They are always up to date. They're always evolving in their definitions as well. Um, and symptoms, I think we're pretty well versed on the typical symptoms and recovery. And again, I can go into this further. I'll touch a little bit about this in my presentations, but I'll stop here with the current treatment and just say a few words about this, just to kind of set the stage for what we're doing. So the current treatment is a short period of full cognitive and physical rest. 
that's where you start with. And that's very much shortened. Gone are the days where you stick somebody in a dark room for a very long time for weeks on end until they're symptom free. They're saying now that's not a good idea. And as they put it to the kids, it messes with your head on a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. When you're stuck in a room all by yourself and you can't look at your phone and you can't look at the TV and you can't look at your screen, imagine for an adolescent what that feels like. So, or us when we're not feeling well and we're stuck at home. So they say shorten that, and it's all about really reintroducing your normal activities of daily life. And slowly, but, but making sure that you've got a little bit of that going on, even during recovery. And it's a balance. It's all about that balance between rest and activity. Um, and I talk, I talk about, when I'm talking to the students about this, and this is all new as of last April, to give you an idea of how this whole management, concussion management, is ever evolving and changing. So I draw the imaginary line and I see here's your line, here's where your symptoms are at. We want to stay down below this line. So you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't make it worse and goes over that line. So you can read, you can look at your phone, you can look at your screen on your computer, video games even, you can do things, but as long as you don't increase your symptoms. And once you do, you gotta back off and rest. So there's that balance. And we all know balance is a big challenge for our adolescent friends as they're trying to, sometimes they're like, oh, I feel great. And here they are, zero to 60 the next minute, I see them the next day. And they're kind of a few steps backwards just because they've tried to do too much all at once. So again, it's that balance and we coach them through that as we move through the protocol. Um, as Brian alluded to, return to learn. And return to learn is gaining much more focus. When we first heard about concussions back around 2008, 9, 10-ish, right in, around in there, it was big with the NHL and the NFL. Of course, we all know about the movie and such that came out. Um, it was all the focus of return to play. After and as through, through the years, it has now evolved into, and they feel that return to learn is actually the, the most important piece. And if you do return to learn well, return to play is gonna go very easily and smoothly for most students. Um, so there's a gradual, again, like return to play, there's a gradual return to activity, but this is cognitive. So this is, the, in our world, of course, this is the academic. And something to remember is that each concussion is very unique. So even if you get a second concussion, that concussion is going to potentially be very unique from the first one that you, that you sustained. Symptoms are typically, are typically become more um, subjective. They're not as visible as a student gets better. So it's, it gets harder and more challenging for us as clinicians to help identify what really is going on with that student and how we can best support them with our protocol. And again, like I said, it's challenging about the, the, to, to find that balance between rest and activity. During return to learn, it's very important. Again, I'm talking about the team. As a nurse, I know and I am taught, we never work alone. We always work with a team. We're always about multidisciplinary teamwork. So this is no different in a concussion. As you can imagine, you have teachers and parents and physicians and specialists and um, staff that I work with, supportive staff, the social workers, the school counselors. All of us play a very important role in helping that student, supporting that student through that concussion recovery. Even when the student can tolerate a full day of school, some accommodations still might need to be in place for that student. And return to play. I won't talk about this very much because I think we're all pretty familiar with this as well. So let me share a little bit of the background of how this came to be and where I come from and, and my approach. Um, my overarching goal always is, as a school nurse, is to keep students healthy, safe, and ready to learn. That's my, that's my mainstay, that's what I operate from, that's the foundation. And to do that, um, I use, and some of you might have heard of this, the whole school, whole community, whole child movement that's out now. This is an approach, it combines the coordinated school health model with the whole child approach so that we, put, we bring together the health outcomes and the educational outcomes, pull them together, to, to provide more services and to pr provide a better outcome, a total better outcome for our children in our communities, which leads to healthier communities. And healthy community is defined by Healthy People 2010 as one that continuously creates and improves both its physical and social environments, helping people to support one another in aspects of daily life and to develop to their fullest potential. If that doesn't say what we do here at Libertyville and Vernon Hills across our district for our students, I don't know what what does. We're all about helping students reach their fullest potential. 
So, and as school nurses, I'm all about helping them from a health lens to reach their fullest potential, potential as well. We bring the knowledge of the educational environment and health systems together. Like I said, we're promoting better health, health outcomes and hopefully, consequently, we're promoting better educational outcomes as well. And then the last, the 21st Century Framework for School Nursing, Nursing, NASN, the National Association of School Nursing, developed this model about two or three years ago now, and that's our foundation for practice. So there's things like care management and quality assurance and leadership and all of those pieces that as a nurse working in a school are very important to us, and we try to, to exude that as we work from day to day. So those are the things that gave me the foundation or um, the theory behind leading me to creating our concussion protocol here at LHS. So it started way back in 2009. Again, if you remember, that's about when concussions started to come to the forefront. They get, we were getting a lot of publicity in the NFL and the NHL and other sports. And we had our, and at that point, we had seen a few concussions here and there, but not that many diagnosed. And it was very traditional in the sense that we got a note from the doctor. It said they were out of their sport and activity for a week, and then they were back in it after that week was over. Um, this particular student was a freshman football player, and he sustained three concussions in about the time of the span of a month. Now, all of us, I hope, at this point in time, ten years, almost 10 years later, would say, what? That's not good. <laughs> and that would never happen in today's world, I hope. It won't happen here. I can say at Libertyville High School that won't happen. Um, so we received one of those notes that said they can go back, or a couple of those notes that said they could go back in about a week or so. On that third concussion, that student, after being knocked unconscious and his symptoms persisted, he was referred to a specialist down at Leary Children's, Dr. Labella. We became very good friends <laughs> through the concussion professional world on how you manage a concussion. Excuse me because she is a concussion specialist and she, I got my first note from her that said he can come to school, he can attend school, but he can't do anything. No tests, no quizzes, no reading, no nothing, just be present in the classroom. So this is the school nurse looking at this going, are you kidding me? How do I tell my teachers that this student can't do anything? They can be there, but don't expect them to do a thing. So even for me, um, and my lack of knowledge at the time about concussions, this was, a tough, this was a tough challenge. And so I'm always about taking doctor's recommendations and translating that into the classroom for the teacher. I want to present it to them from their lens so they know <laughs> what to expect from their student and how to interact with the, with the student as well. So that's when I began my own research into concussions. I, I started by identifying an issue. So this was an issue, wondered about it a little bit more, started doing some research, and then after the year, as the year progressed, started to see the incidence of concussions rise at LHS. Um, I saw lots of different symptoms, saw lots of different presentations, all sorts of things. We started to, <coughs> excuse me, we started to gather some information. I went to my supervisor, Oli Stevens, and said, hey, We've got something brewing here. I don't know what's going on, but I see this growing and not really um, lessening, but becoming more of an issue. Um, we're doing these things, but I feel like we're doing things all over the place, and it, there's no organized attack or an organized um, um, pursuit of care for these kids. So I made a list, and I um, that summer, I found out through my feelers and professional connections that Glenbrook South High School was way ahead of the learning curve on concussions and already had a fully functioning um, uh, protocol. And so I contacted their athletic trainer, their school nurse, got information, they graciously shared their protocol with me and that summer was my summer project of taking their protocol, taking the evidence-based research I had read, combining those, knowing my environment here in LHS and how our systems are in place and tweaking it and creating a protocol that fit what I thought fit our needs here at LHS. And then that fall, I approached our administrators and went to building council, and I had data already for them. I collected, I presented the data. I had a rough draft of a protocol and a proposal for a task force with a timeline ready to go. And um, they graciously approved it and said, yep, go for it. And so. Um, after pulling the protocol together and spending a year hashing out and tweaking and 
and making it even better for our students at Libertyville, we um, formalized it in May 2011. And then that fall, we launched it. And I invited Dr. Labella to talk with our staff because I, I observed that there was a definite educational need there too for staff. So they understood from the classroom what to expect for these kids that were dealing with concussions. And over the years, our protocol has evolved as the current research does, as I said. We continue to learn and we tweak our system as new research comes out. <coughs> and we change and um, improve our monitoring systems for all of our kids. And I'll share a few examples of that a little bit later. Here's our concussion oversight team at Libertyville. Um, you can see the diversity and the multidisciplinary approach that we have. This is from research and this is from um, other schools that I chatted with. <coughs> Just making sure that all the different areas are a part of our oversight team. And that's part of one of the laws is that, that we have to have an oversight team in place. Thankfully, we already had our task force ready to go. And so we just switched over and became the official oversight team. So um, a question that I was asked by Brian is to describe what our progression is once we find out about a diagnosis or there's a report of an injury. So this is what we do. We get the report um, from a couple of ways. The athletic trainer we might get it from. We might get it from the actual coach through their reports, <coughs> excuse me, their head injury reports. A parent might call us or the LST, and the LST has been fabulous about calling us. They now know that the terms head injury and concussion um, and those are buzzwords for them, and they give us a call in the nurse's office. So we can do some follow-up, and then we either call the student if they're in school, <coughs> excuse me, we call the student down to talk to us about how they're feeling, we l assess their symptoms, and if they have been diagnosed, we take the appropriate steps, and if they haven't, then we might be recommending some follow-up with the parents at that point. The idea is that we want to um, try to, to notify the student and the family as soon as possible because we know then we can talk to them about that shortened time of rest and we can explain what the protocol looks like. We can share what a concussion looks like and symptoms to watch for and things to watch for in those early times because you may not see the symptoms right away. They sometimes evolve over a period of time and what we've developed this year to try to, to um, protect the student and to help the teachers if we don't have a diagnosis and we're kind of not sure how things are going, the student seems okay, but we know that as the day goes on, they might start to feel some symptoms. We give them a note to share with their teacher. We call it a teacher pass, and it's been working terrifically for us for that little window of time where we may not have a diagnosis, but we think something's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. So we do that. Um, and then if there's a diagnosis, or we're very, we're very certain that there's going to be a diagnosis, then we're notifying teachers through an email. And it's not just teachers. I have a set email, standard email, that explains what a concussion is, explains very briefly the overview of the management of a concussion now. And I give them a copy of our protocol. So it's teachers, it's the athletic trainer if they're in a sport, it's the coach. So the coach is aware right away as well. They typically know, but we like to let them to know formally that there's a, there's a concussion. And then they're involved in the, the comments that I might make to teachers to update as we go through recovery. Um, the athletic directors as well, so they can support the coaches if they have any questions or athletic trainers along the way. We also, if they're in band or if they're in fine arts, I'm contact, I include Dustin Helvey, our fine arts director as well, so he can take care of things from that end if there's any concerns or things that I might not be aware of or activities that are coming up. Um, social worker, school counselor, all of those people who are critical to that student in their concussion recovery. First day back for the student, they come directly to us. We talk, we explain the protocol to them, hopefully they understand it. You never know that first day back, they're a little foggy still, so it's a constant coaching and chatting with them daily. We do a daily check-in with them. We have a Google Doc that we've um, created. We use that as our assessment tool. It's a zero to six rating, rate your headache, rate your nausea, rate um, your processing, rate different aspects of, con of a concussion symptom so that we have a better idea of what they're feeling. Because we all know if we ask a teen how they're feeling, they just might say, okay, I'm good. And we want a little bit more. And this tool really helps them express themselves and share with us how they're feeling. Once the student is symptom free and they get a note from their doctor to clear them, if they're an athlete, they get to start the return to play progression with the, the athletic trainer. If they're not an athlete, but they're in PE, 
um, and we've received that clearance, then we're going to work with, we don't have a formalized system for return to play in PE. And at the grade schools, you'll hear about this issue with recess. How do you return a student safely to recess if they're younger? There's nothing in the law, and there's not a lot out there in best practice or research except to say if they're returning to physical activity, they should go through some sort of return to play activity. So we talk with the PE teachers and find out what the, the current activity is. We find out if we can get them on a stationary bike, maybe in the cardio room if they're near there and they can be monitored. They do a little bit there. They come back. They report to us. We go through our steps of asking them how their symptoms are and we, when we progress them that way. It's a little more informal, but we still um, we are on the side of caution. We're very conservative with that because it's not a formal return to play process. And we want to make sure, again, safety. It's all about safety and making sure the kids return safely to their activities. <coughs> if the symptoms are prolonged beyond the average two to three week period recovery period, then we're looking at something different. We might be chatting with the, the parents and their primary physician about seeking out some specialist care and support. There might be some therapies. You might have heard about vestibular therapy, physical therapy for a concussion. That's balance therapy or vision therapy. Some things like that that might help speed along that recovery time. And we're also, in the back of my mind, I'm starting to wonder, hmm, is this kid going to need a 504? Is this really going to be prolonged? We are terrific here at, at LHS about supporting our students, accommodating their needs. Um, so the, the formal 504 I'm not as concerned about for that reason, but for other reasons moving on forward down the line, I want to make sure that these kids have what they need um, officially to support them and make sure they're well taken care of in, for their future too if needed. Um, IEPs are very rarely needed. We had one student that had that potential for an IEP, and that was a very, very traumatic brain injury and other things going on along with the concussion. So um, another piece of this whole process is evaluation. For me as a nurse, this is a very important part of any process of anything that we do. We're constantly evaluating and tweaking and improving. Um, it's very important in this protocol, and I've alluded to that, how we're looking for ways to always update and stay, stay current with what we do. Um, I collect feedback not only from nurses and students and parents and how they felt going through the protocol, but of course staff. Teachers are constantly giving me great, unique, creative ideas of things that we can do for these kids in the classroom to support them. There's technology out there that they're pointing me to to support kids, like audio learning is much easier than visual learning for some of them, so they're pointing me to different resources and such, so I really appreciate that. Um, an example of something that we added a couple years ago, we had our first student that was in driver's ed with a concussion, and we all kind of went, oh yeah, we definitely don't want this kid out there on the road driving with a concussion. So we quickly added that to our protocol as well, for obvious reasons, a safety issue for everybody involved. Um, and then we added our fine arts department director, Dustin, as I said, that was a, a late addition as well because we, believe it or not, or maybe you would if you've seen some of the recent musicals that we've done here on roller skates and things, we've had, although we, ne we did not have a concussion from that, the roller skating musical, if you all remember that one, I said a lot of prayers during that season. <laughs> um, but we did have some concussions from musicals, so for various unusual reasons, and so that presented a whole different level of challenges with rehearsals, practices, what's required, keeping those kids safe, giving them the ability to rest and not feel the pressure of having to attend a, a performance or a, a rehearsal that would go to 9, to 10, nine or 10 o'clock at night. So, so those are the kinds of things that we constantly are looking to tweak and add to our concussion. We meet, or concussion protocol, we meet um, at least once a year. And we do that either by email or we meet at, in person, which I think we'll do this year, just because we've got some other things that um, I want to talk through in person, some challenges that have arisen. So it's really, I, I love our group. I love what we do. Um, I'm so proud of, like I said, the entire staff that has played a role in this from being a student's teacher to being on the concussion oversight team. Now the statistics. I know you all are really interested in statistics. <laughs> Um, and where we're at with our concussions. So really, truly, overall, we, we definitely hit the mark in the national averages. So I've collected statistics that going all the way back from, to 2009. So I've, we've seen 470 concussions come through our office in that time. 
And um, you'll see, um, I think it comes out pretty well. The blue is the total concussions. The athletic is the red, I believe. And then the non-athletic is the shorter one. So you can see ath athletics plays a, a critical role in concussions in our school. And really, it truly, across the board, that's where you'll see the most concussions, of course. Concussions by grade and gender, just an interesting stat. Um, both girls are definitely, they, they see more concussions in girls. And most of the articles that I read, that's just across the board. And there's lots of theories for that. Um, so I broke it down by sport and by gender, because I thought this was interesting as well. So 257 females, and the number one sport, which I think most of us would guess, is soccer. So, and then cheer, and cheer is just starting to come through in stats, in research when you read it. It hadn't been there before. Volleyball and home, things that happened at home or outside of the school. Um, basketball, car accident. And so you can see water polo is on the rise too as more and more girls get involved. And something with these sports too, it's not just about high school sports. This includes club sports. So I broke that down and I can show you those numbers if you're really curious. Um, th that is growing. So we're starting to see that. And kids are playing sports year round. So we're seeing an increase in concussions for a number of reasons. Um, something to keep in mind, I was just at a conference where a pediatrician, a, a sports doctor, talked about overuse injuries and how kids are constantly in sports and they're specializing in one sport, which isn't that good, according to this one physician he spoke on the dangers of that. And because they're in constant sports, they're seeing more injuries. Concussions is just one of them. And here are the males, and we all could guess, football. Football is definitely the highest number um, across the board between males and females. So those are, those are my statistics. That's my information. I'm glad to take a few questions. I know we're on a tight schedule, so if we don't have time, I'm, I'm going to stick around for a little while, and then I've left my contact information for you as well. Any, any questions for Cam from the board or students? Well, I'm assuming we do similar at Vernon Hills too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they do have a protocol. Yeah, I just didn't feel comfortable yeah. speaking no, directly right. to that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Cam, we want to thank you for yeah, your leadership, uh, of course, you know, in the district and at Libertyville on this issue, and you've, you've certainly taken us to kind of the front edge or the leading edge of this, and um, it's uh, really quite amazing to see it in action. So, um, our, our, our kids are certainly, and parents, of course, are certainly the beneficiaries of, of those efforts, um, and I know that as more research continues to develop that you, you, your group will do exactly what you talked about doing tonight. It will fold that in. It will make additions wherever they need to be. So we just want to thank you for everything that you've done, okay? Sure, sure. Thank, you. thank you. Well, before we begin uh, our presentation on school safety and security, we have a number of special guests with us this evening. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just stand up and remain standing. When we get done, we'll all give you a round of applause for uh, your efforts in coming tonight and uh, working behind the scenes with us. So first of all, uh, our police chiefs from Libertyville, Clint Hurtigan. Clint, would you stand? And from Vernon, uh, Vernon Hills, Pat Kreese. So thank both of you for coming. from. From uh, our fire chiefs, fire department chiefs from Libertyville, Rich Karani, and from Countryside, which includes obviously Vernon Hills, Jeff Steingart, <laughs> Associate Superintendent Brian Kelly, Assistant Principals uh, from LHS, Eric Marosher, and from VHHS, Greg Stilling, Team Leaders, uh, Jason Schrader and Megan Silverberg from LHS, and Bill Bellacomo from Vernon Hills, our school resource officers. Uh, from LHS, Dusan Rasek, and from VHHS, Santos Rodriguez, and from school security and safety staffs from LHS, Bob Ulix, and from VHHS, Tina Blom uh, Blomgren. So uh, let's give them all a round of applause. And uh, thank you for all your work with us. And you may be seated now. Thank you.
Well, good evening. My name is Dr. Prentice Lee, and I'm the superintendent at Community High School District 128. As we all now know, a little more than a week ago, another unimaginable mass shooting tragedy took place at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. LHS and VHHS principals Tom Calentis and John Gilliam, and then I, share detailed messages with LHS and VHHS students and parents in the wake of that horrific event. As parents and students like me, you may be feeling profound sadness and or anger about the Douglas High School shooting, but also at what data suggests is a disturbing and growing trend in public schools as multiple school shootings have occurred across the nation in recent years. That trend and the ensuing loss of lives in such mindless acts of violence are concerning and scary. Following up on information that Dr. Gilliam and Dr. Kalinas shared with students, staff, and parents earlier, on behalf of the District 128 Board of Education and Administration, I want to assure you that the health, wellness, and safety of our students and staff has been <coughs> and will continue to be our highest priority. As Dr. Gilliam, Dr. Kalinas, and I noted, consulting with school security experts and local law enforcement, District 128 has invested several million dollars over the past few years to install state-of-the-art security upgrades at LHS, VHHS, and the District 128 office. Some of those upgrades are very visible and obvious, and others, by design, are not, and they will never be. In addition, we continue to utilize and effectively partner with our extremely knowledgeable and professional local police departments and related first responders in Libertyville and Vernon Hills in developing, assessing, and implementing school security plans, including our substantive emergency crisis drills. In addition, District 128 has long partnered with Libertyville and Vernon Hills Police Departments to share the cost of armed, highly trained, full-time police resource officers at LHS and VHHS. Also, the Lake County Rapid Response Group, which would respond in an extreme emergency shooter situation, has and continues to do live rapid response training at both LHS and VHHS. We, we are honored to provide the Rapid Response Group the opportunity to do live training at both schools to hone um, and improve their response. But also, because as a result of training in our buildings, the response group is familiar with our buildings if they would ever need to respond at LHS and VHHS. Finally, as Dr. Gilliam, Dr. Colentis, and I have shared, every school shooting situation is different. However, law enforcement continues to advise us that the best first line of defense to prevent such tragedies is for students to report anything concerning or out of the ordinary to adults, and for the adults to then process that information. As such, we encourage students and or parents to share anything concerning or out of the ordinary with us, and we will thoroughly assess and act on the information as required. We call that see something, share something. Our commitment and approach to providing a safe school climate as the foundation of our two excellent high schools has never been more important than in the world we live in today. We have invested in and taken profound structural security measures over the past four years. And we continue to work closely with law enforcement to learn and then apply the knowledge that is gained to our security assessment, planning, and application at LHS, VHHS, and our district office. We will continue to work together to ensure the health, wellness, and safety of students and staff. To that end, this evening, we would like to take the opportunity to provide a holistic overview and review of our school safety and security work. For our presentation tonight, beyond uh, my introduction and overview, uh, we will look at building security measures, security technology, school safety and security personnel, community resources, proactive school safety and security measures, and then uh, we will have a closing and a final review, and then we will be happy to take questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Associate Superintendent Brian Kelly. Brian? Thanks, Dr. Lee. So again, he mentioned that we're gonna um, 
talk a little bit about our building security measures, some of the technology <coughs> that we've um, implemented in our building, look at some of the resources that we utilize with our personnel, but also with the community. So to do that, to help us, I'm going to utilize a lot of the people that were introduced just a little bit earlier, from our school resource officers to our team leaders, um, to our um, security safety um, personnel. So they'll get up here and talk, and we'll kind of give an overview. And at the end, our hope is if you have any questions, feel free to you know ask some questions. So to kind of start us off, to kind of um, just kind of get in the mood of the lockdown, and uh, we have a video from um, Dusan Racic. So we're going to start that video. Hello, my name is Deuce Rasick and I'm a school resource officer here at Libertyville High School. Today, I'm going to show you the procedures for a school lockdown. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a school lockdown is a means of securing the building and its occupants from both internal and external threats. There are seven steps involved to a school lockdown. Step one, look into the hallway and bring in any students and staff. Teachers, upon hearing the lockdown alarm, you should check the hallways outside of your room. Have those students and staff members in the hallway immediately enter your room and close your door. Please keep in mind that the classroom doors are default locked. Students should enter the nearest classroom that they are directed towards. In the absence of a nearby classroom, you should secure yourself in the nearest room as soon as possible. Or leave the building if you are near an exit. Please keep in mind that if you leave the building, you may not know the location of the threat. Please exercise caution. If students and staff are outside of the school when a lockdown has been initiated, do not make any attempts to enter the school. If you see the exterior lockdown strobes activated, leave the area until you've been notified by officials that the area is safe and secure for you to return. Step number two, close the door and make sure it's secure. Please make sure that you pull the door closed. The fob activated locks will only function for 30 seconds after a lockdown is initiated, which will provide the user a short period of time to open an already closed door with your fob. Once 30 seconds have elapsed, all fobs will be deactivated until after the conclusion of the lockdown. Step number three, close the room's blinds. Closing the blinds prevents threats from seeing possible targets, both directly and by reducing the amount of ambient light inside the room. This also makes the room appear as if it is empty. Step number four, turn off all lights. Like step number three, turning off the lights reduces the chances of being seen by a potential threat. If a threat can't see you, the likelihood of harm is reduced. Step number five, find the blind spot or safe corner of the room and away from the door. Staying away from the door and out of sight in conjunction with steps number three and number four reduces the likelihood that you will be detected by a threat. It may also reduce your chances of injury should a door be breached. Step number six, silence cell phones and stay off cell phones. Although you may be tempted to use your cell phone, doing so may increase your risk of harm and place first responders at a disadvantage. It is important to silence your phones and stay off them. If a threat can't hear you, it can't find you. Additionally, if a large number of people use their cell phones at the same time, it can overload the cellular network and obstruct communications for first responders. Please stay off your cell phones. Step number seven, be prepared to blockade the door if needed and be prepared to fend off anyone penetrating the room. There may be a need to blockade the door. There are many ways to do this, whether it be by placing furniture such as desks and bookshelves against the door, or binding the door arm with a belt. You should use whatever objects you can to block the door as effectively as possible. In a lockdown situation where a threat is present, the police will make every effort to arrive at the scene and stop the threat as soon as possible. However, there may be a need for you to take action prior to police intervention. As a last resort, if your door is breached by a threat, you have every right to take whatever measures necessary to protect yourself. Use whatever items you have available. These items can include books, Chromebooks, staplers, etc. Protect yourself with whatever means you have at your disposal. Now that we have gone through the steps to a lockdown, let's review. Step number one, look into the hallway and bring in any students and staff. Step number two, close the door and make sure it's secure. Step number three, close the room's blinds. Step number four, turn off all lights. Step number five, find the blind spot or safe corner of the room and stay away from the door. Step number six, silence cell phones and stay off cell phones. 
Step number seven, be prepared to blockade the door if needed and be prepared to fend off anyone penetrating the room. I hope that this information was both informative and helpful. By following the proper procedures, we can greatly reduce the risk of harm should a threat arise. Now, ultimately, prevention is our greatest asset. Please notify LHS staff should you ever hear of any threats directed against the school and its occupants, even if you believe it may be a joke. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much for your attention and please be safe. That lockdown drill video just kind of gives you a glimpse of some of the safety measures you have. We're going to talk about a lot of those in our presentation today. So the first that I want to introduce are Bob Ulix from LHS and Tina Blomgren from Vernon Hills. They're in charge of our security and staff, uh, safety staff. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Bob Ulix, the Director of Campus Safety at Libertyville High School. I also previously had the privilege of serving as the School Resource Officer at LHS from 2004 till 2016. Um, there are several aspects to school safety, both physical and interpersonal. I'll begin tonight with some of the physical things that we do uh, to keep our kids safe. One of the first things you'll notice at Libertyville and Vernon Hills High School are the ballards. Uh, ballards create a barrier to stop or slow down a vehicle either accidentally or uh, intentionally uh, directed towards our entrance. Uh, while they're decorative in nature, um, they're very effective, extremely effective in slowing a threat. Uh, we've seen that more in the world where people are now using vehicles as weapons. It's the same technology and, uh, that they employ at State Department buildings, government buildings, and embassies. Safety film on entrances, windows, and doors. Uh, this is a safety film that we've used for years here at LHS um, and Vernon Hills. What the safety film does is fortify the glass and significantly delays or prevents the glass from being compromised, thus providing time to identify um, a threat and address that threat appropriately. We have a small video for you to watch. Um, what I'll just note is in the video, there are two small vignettes. The one on the left is without safety film. The one on the right has the safety film. So that would have almost completely effectively stopped the Sandy Hook incident. That was the way he got into that school was shooting through the glass. So um, I won't get into ballistics uh, because that's a, a very complicated issue, but I can tell you that we use safety film on all of our entrances, the doors and windows located, as well as other uh, specific areas in the school. Uh, the next thing, we have entrance doors locked with a two-stage entry system and intercom system. The entrance doors are locked daily at the beginning of school. Um, they are locked at a certain uh, predetermined time that we've programmed for the evening and mornings as well. But once school starts, every door is locked in the school. Therefore, someone that's coming to school to, as a visitor, guest, appointment, whatever the case, or someone that doesn't have an actual reason to be here, we can stop them and assess them before they come into the building. So we can first find out who they're, why they're here. We can let them into the first stage of the entry system, assign a visitor's badge, do the proper background check, um, establish if they have an appointment, and then let them in. If we, if we identify a problem or something just doesn't seem right, 
we can also contain them in our vestibule area and then have time to notify law enforcement. Um, Non-main entrance doors, meaning most, uh, both schools have two entrances that can be used. Those doors are also equipped with a system that has a camera and a door buzzer. So for instance, students, teachers, other people uh, can ask to be let in and we can remotely do that. We don't do it as a normal practice, but obviously it is a school and we do try to keep into consideration inclement weather, things like that when we're dealing with our students. And then lastly, we have safety and security staff that monitor both of our desks daily. They're there all the time during the school. Uh, actually, the, the working hours are 5.30 a.m. when practices start. There is someone there to monitor all the way up until 10 o'clock at night or later, depending on the event. So again, we have two, two levels of safety, physical and interpersonal, and we try to mesh them both. Uh, right now, I'll turn this over to my counterpart at Vernon Hills, Tina Blomgren. Um, like Bob mentioned, um, we have a two-stage entry system. Um, the visitor can be checked in through our Raptor technology, which is a, um, it's a, sex of, a national sex offender database. Um, it also, we can also look at a local list of visitors that should not be allowed into our building um, that we have entered in ourselves. Uh, some of the other features that we have at the front desk is a computer system with a real-time video feed from around the building, both inside and outside of the building. The safety and security staff, uh, in addition, has access to radios. It gives them the ability to communicate with our school resource officer, our deans, and also our school administrators. All right, thanks. Um, so we have camera, cameras that monitor the building, uh, both inside and out. Uh, our cameras inside the building monitor really the entire building throughout the day. Um, they can also be monitored by the police. Um, they have them in some of their cars at the police station. Um, they monitor our hallways. Um, you know, the gyms, really we can use them to play back if an incident occurs, um, but they give us a live feed of what's happening in our building. Uh, they're, you know, the cameras feed to the front doors like Tina mentioned, but also into the security office, of course. Um, and then we, we review the video footage every morning of anything that happened overnight to see if there's anything that was going on that we need to follow up on. Um, we have external cameras on the outside of the campus. Some of them pan to cover all directions. Some of them are fixed on specific locations. The parking lots are certainly an area that we use the cameras quite a bit for. Our, you know, our athletic fields, tennis courts, those kinds of things. You know, these come in handy if, if something's going on outside the building. We might see it before it gets to us. And then we can also use it to replay. All of our cameras are recorded and kept for a period of time so we can go back and review it um, to see what, you know, to see what went on. Um, at the exterior of the building we have security signage, which I think does a few things. One is it's kind of a proactive measure to let people know um, you're on camera, so don't do anything you shouldn't do here. Uh, also, we have the no trespassing signs. We let people know they're subject to search when they're on a school campus. So it's kind of just a heads up that, hey, you're on a school campus, act the way you're supposed to on a school campus. They would also help us if someone does violate the rules and we do need to prosecute someone, the signage is up there to allow us to do that. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Eric Morosier. <clears throat> The vast majority of doors of both VHHS and LHS are equipped with fob readers. All of the offices and classrooms are equipped with emergency call buttons that can be used to contact the main office as well as the two main security desks. And all school lockdown can be accessed in multiple areas of the building as well as remotely. The internal and external lockdown strobes are also tied into the building-wide PA system. When a lockdown has been initiated, several things occur. System broadcast, the lockdown alarm siren, 
both inside and outside of the building, as well as the repeated automated message <coughs> indicating to lock down. The lockdown strobes are activated, which serves as a visual indication of the lockdown for those areas like a band room or an auto shop where classroom volume could prevent students and staff from hearing a lockdown siren and repeated lockdown messages. As part of this system, during a lockdown, emails are automatically sent to the three buildings, VHHS, LHS, district office, alerting to the lockdown. Contact is also made to the driver red cars informing them of the lockdown, thus rerouting them to an alternate location. Also with these actions, when a lockdown has been activated, all doors with fob readers lock, lock immediately. Throughout the year, VHHS and LHS utilize InterQuest K-9 search services. In addition to drugs and alcohol, these highly trained golden retrievers are trained to passively indicate should they encounter gunpowder residue. Securely is a software utilized by VHHS and LHS that flags student content or searches conducted on D-128 issued Chromebooks that might indicate potential harm to self or harm to others. Administrators are notified when such content has been flagged. Both VHHS and LHS employ a full-time safety security staff. Safety and security are located throughout the building as well as outside the campus. Many are former firemen, police officers, and military personnel. Worthy of note, between the two buildings, our safety security teams have a combined 144 years of prior police, fire, or military experience. All members of these safety security teams attend ongoing training, which includes CPR and AED training. Part of the ongoing daily responsibilities of these teams is to monitor cameras, building entrances, restrooms, and other key areas of the facility. I'd like to introduce VHHS School Resource Officer Santos Rodriguez. Good evening. Uh, my name is Santos Rodriguez. I'm the Vernon Hills Police Officer assigned to the high school. My counterpart is Deuce Racing, a Libertyville uh, Police Officer assigned to Libertyville High School. Our goal as SROs is to provide a safe learning environment, be a resource to staff, students, and parents. We create and maintain positive relationships with students throughout our day. We try to reduce juvenile crime by helping students formulate awareness of rules, authority, and justice. <clears throat> we address these matters not only as law enforcement officers, but also as mentors and guest speakers in classrooms. We work closely with school administration in regards to school safety and security. <clears throat> we as SROs frequently speak to the students, answer questions uh, they may have in regards to laws and ordinances they come across throughout their young lives around town. We also are part of the uh, both emergency response teams and crisis teams. Officer Racic will explain further. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much. Um, as part of our ongoing efforts to maintain the safety, security, and well-being of our students and staff, we have two teams uh, that help meet these needs. One being our crisis team, and the other being our emergency response team. Uh, now our crisis team is a group composed of administrators, team directors, counselors, social workers, the SROs, as well as other staff members. The team meets to help mitigate any significant events or radical changes, which can include bomb threats, uh, student or staff deaths, and other major campus incidents. Uh, the team's purpose is to evaluate these situations, properly communicate information, and to provide assistance. Uh, our emergency response team is a similar group of individuals that oversees responses to emergencies such as active shooter incidents, um, fires, natural disasters, even power outages. <clears throat> An important component to our emergency response team is of course our emergency response manual. These manuals essentially list the appropriate guidelines and protocols on how each specific type of incident is to be handled. Uh, the manual is also readily available to our first responders uh, with regards to the Libertyville Police Department as well as the Vernon Hills Police Department. 
Um, also, these uh, manuals are also reviewed annually to see if there's anything that can be added to them. We also have what we refer to as emergency response team members who possess uh, what we call our emergency response team kits. Uh, contained within each kit is a student roster, bus information, as well as the manual, school maps, and other materials that will enable anyone who bears this kit to manage and operate as well to operate the situation as well as to account for students, staff, and resources. Finally, each school also has an emergency command center, also referred to as emergency room. Um, these rooms is where the emergency response teams can convene and uh, perform their, and conduct their plans. Uh, each room has standalone power, independent from the rest of the building, along with a landline phone system. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Yearly is required by the Regional Office of Education. Um, we're required to meet as a team to kind of review our safety measures. Uh, so our team will get together, much, much of the people that are presenting tonight, plus our fire departments from Countryside and Libertyville, plus our school nurses and a few other key personnel. So we meet uh, yearly to kind of go over our safety review for the year. We talk about the drills that will be conducted throughout the year from our fire drill, tornado drill, lockdown drill. Um, talk about the video um, that you saw earlier on the lockdown drill. Um, and just a note, even though the Regional Office of Education requires one annual safety meeting, um, we have more meetings throughout the year, whether it's in a larger group, a smaller group, and I think those meetings um, are just as important. So just to meet the minimum needs isn't always the best, but we're constantly meeting as groups to try to um, create some of the best uh, safety protocols and procedures that we can in our buildings. Um, and again, that includes, you know, looking at our um, lockdown protocols too, outside of the building, and we've refined those over the years, from our driver's ed vehicles to how do we notify somebody that's out on a field? Um, they don't, they may not hear things, so we do have strobe lights that are outside the buildings and our teachers are aware of that. So we'll go through all that and we're constantly monitoring that throughout the year um, and in our annual safety review. One of the things that Dr. Lee talked about was our rapid deployment training in the buildings for local law enforcement. I think you know, that's one thing that's helped our local law enforcement uh, keep up with their training, but I think it's also helped us. And maybe along the way, they're giving us some pointers back about some things to look for um, in the building. So um, it's been, a, uh, I think, a good partnership with our community and working, again, uh, under the Regional Office of Education. But one of the things that really, I think, helps us along the way is some of the um, relationships that we build with our students and our staff um, and that they build with each other. And we talked a little bit about those two pieces. So there's the piece of the building and the technology, but there's the other piece of, uh, you know, really working with the, uh, the people in our building. So the next group I'd like to introduce, and they'll talk a little bit more about it, is our LST team leaders. So if Bill, Jason, and Megan would join us. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, my name is Jason Schrader, and my uh, goal here is to try to paint a picture of, of our learning support team uh, system, LSC system that we use not only here at Libertyville High School, but also with at Vernon Hills High School. Um, in an effort to try to increase our communication, build relationships, make a big school seem manageable, not only for our students, uh, but our parents and our families, and give all stakeholders a home base, we have learning support teams. Um, our student service department is divided up into these learning support teams. The learning support team consists of, but not only, team directors or deans. Our role is to kind of oversee the team, organize the team, but also to be a member of the team as the, to oversee discipline and attendance. The school counselors, their area of expertise would be academic. They help build the schedules. They can add and drop classes. Parents and students can go to see them for advice on their four-year plan. Social workers, they focus on the social-emotional aspect of our students, and they're also a resource to our families. Um, educational support personnel, our ESPs, those are the 
what we like to call our office managers of the learning support team. Those are the ones that you talk to when you call in. If you, have, um, if you are going to call your son or daughter out for a dentist appointment, most likely you're going to talk to one of the ESPs and they're going to help manage that. They're going to be the first ones that you see when you walk into the LSD. Um, representative from special services are also on the team. We have our school nurse, Cam. I couldn't say that, I couldn't go without saying that. She's a vital member of the team. And the school resource officer. They're all members of this team, okay? Um, I think the goal is to provide a one-stop shop for our students and our parents to go to with any questions as far as student services, um, uh, academics, uh, behavior, just questions in general uh, uh, for their students as they're here. That one-stop shop is what we want to do. Um, the teams are divided by an alpha slice. So here at LHS, we have three teams, an A through F team, a Q through Z team, or excuse me, A through F, G through P is the team that I'm on, and the third is Q through Z. So um, uh, students are on those teams for four years. Um, if I could kind of paint a picture, and Eric Morosher, this is Eric's um, picture that he always says, if you look at a high school like a big wagon wheel, and all the different spokes are clubs, activities, sports, fine arts, uh, health and safety, academics, all the different initiatives, the hub of the wheel is the learning support team that holds it all together. That's where the relationships are built. And our number one ultimate goal is that each one of our students has a connection at the schoolhouse and that LST can provide that connection. But we're also there for teachers, for the monitors, for security, for support personnel, for coaches, for sponsors to reach out with any questions that they may have so we can help facilitate those questions. Okay. Next up is Bill Bellicomo. Thanks, Jason. Uh, in LST, we have many things in place already that, that we use for, for information about our students and, and to, to provide information to our students and to our staff. If you look up there, first thing that we use is the online bullying report. It can be accessed on both websites. Uh, if a student feels that they're being bullied or, or, or harmed by someone in the school, they can make an, an anonymous report or they can, they can put their name on it. Uh, a lot of the reports that we get are very specific. Some of the reports that we get are from someone who witnessed the bullying and, and they just they just thought it wasn't right and they, they reported it. Or if they hear something on a bus or anywhere in the hallway that just doesn't sound right <laughs> or, or if a student is in need, uh, this is a place where our students can, can uh, report it. We utilize this information, we can act promptly. Uh, the information uh, usually right away and we, we can investigate and, and, and get the, the student the right support that they need. Uh, learning support team. Uh, Jason outlined all the members of the learning support team. We have weekly meetings. Uh, these meetings, we talk about different concerns. It could be academic, it could be medical, it could be social, emotional, but this provides us to meet as a team, discuss and everybody be on the same page uh, and, and what best ways to, to service our kids, okay? Students concerned the email by our uh, staff. The staff is the eyes and ears out there in the hallway and in the classroom, and our staff is invested, and I, and I feel comfortable saying that at both buildings. They care about our kids, they develop those, you hear the word relationships a lot, they develop those relationships and they come to us if they notice a student uh, maybe going through a difficult time, if they notice grades slipping, if they notice an attendance issue, if they hear something, or if a student just comes to them and approaches them and a lot of times we get those reports and, and, and we can act on them and work as a team and, and best service those students. But our, our staff is a great asset for us at the, in the learning support team. Uh, communication and follow up with our students. Anytime we deal with a student, it's important to close that circle. Uh, let the student know that, 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 that this is the issue, we moved on, or this is what we've done, and communicate with them. Also, it's important for us as deans to get out and communicate to our, sta our staff and our students. We, we regularly go to uh, department meetings and discuss uh, you know, what the learning support team does and how we can support them. We also try to get into classrooms. Um, we, we visit the PE classroom and discuss with our students where to find the bu online bullying report, where they can go to to access certain resources and help in certain situations. Um, and it's, it's important for us to be visible in the, in the hallways and develop those relationships before school, during lunch hour. So you can also see us as deans that, 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 that hand out discipline, but we're also intermixing with the students and then they feel more comfortable to come to us later if, if, they, if they have an issue and they, they know we're approachable. 
Megan will discuss the, the last three. Hi, thanks again. I'm just here to discuss some more proactive safety measures that we're implementing um, at the LST Learning Support Team and school-wide level. Um, we are actually working to implement evidence-based and research-based school-wide prevention and intervention initiatives at both schools. At Libertyville High School this year, we're implementing what we call the Green Dot Program, which empowers bystander training. So if students or staff see something, they know how to say something, distract, and then let an adult know um, and intervene at the peer level and then the teacher uh, student level. Um, we're also working at both schools to implement restorative justice practices and restorative practices overall. So this is looking at building positive restorative relationships with students, with staff and families, but then also using that in our discipline role to not only address a concern that comes to our office um, where there's been harm just to address that specific behavior, for instance, with a staff member or teacher and a student, but then also to work together to rebuild and repair that relationship. So what happened in class, but then also for the teacher and student to work together on who was impacted, how it impacts the greater community, and then what that student could do to rebuild and repair that relationship with either their fellow student or their teacher. So again, we're addressing behavior, but then we're also rebuilding and reconnecting students in our communities. Um, we are also a great um, example of at Libertyville and Vernon Hills about student participation. So last school year we had over 94% of our students participate in at least one or more activities, clubs, sports. Um, with that being said, it again creates positive healthy connections um, with students, with one another, and then with coaches and staff members. Um, another proactive safety measure is our school safety and security staff. Obviously there's two representatives here. Um, but they are the first person most students see when they walk in the door um, and they do know students by name they ask about their extracurriculars they go and supervise their extracurriculars and they truly build a strong positive um, and working with us to build restorative relationships when they do have to intervene um, and just to reiterate the last thing i think our strongest you know as my counterpart said um, the most important proactive safety measure that we implement every day in the learning support team is building and rebuilding and reconnecting um, with students, with families, with one another to create strong, safe, um, and healthy schools every day. Again, a lot of these safety procedures and steps that we put in place would not be possible with our, without the support of our community. Um, from the Village of Libertyville, Village of Vernon Hill, the Countryside Fire Department. Um, their participation in our drills throughout the year and helping us out and helping us improve and get better at the things that we have to put into place. You know, some of the things we do have some appreciation breakfast for them and outreach programs for them throughout the year. And then, again, it's another good way to bring them into our building and get them to know our staff and know our students. And our students may be used to seeing some of them around, which is great. Um, but a big, a big part of it too is our community and our parents. You know, their partnerships in our organizations and our schools, um, their support really helps. Again, it's a big part of the relationships. I know we talked a lot about, you know, some of the, you know, the building security measures we put into place, technology, but I think a big part of it is just those proactive and those relationships that are built with our staff and our students and our parents and the community to help. So we have to be proactive, I think, in, in two pieces. And, and again, that's our, you know, uh, you know, I guess the foundation, the building piece, but also the, the interpersonal piece. And I think that's important. So hopefully that kind of gives you an overview of a lot of different pieces um, that go into place for our, our safety and security measures here at D District 128. So I guess I'll turn it over back to Dr. Lee to kind of close up here. Well, just a couple of things to um, uh, complete the presentation before we move to um, the questions. The most important thing for our parents and our communities to know is that we have a long history of the part building the partnerships necessary to do what we're doing now. And that's evidenced by uh, the ladies and gentlemen who are here with us this evening, the work that um, our colleagues that have talked this evening are doing in the building uh, with our students and working with parents. We are totally committed to ensuring a safe and secure learning environment for our students. The foundation of any high school, no matter where it's located, 
is a safe and secure learning environment. Because if we do not have a safe and secure learning environment, we cannot help kids be successful if they're not in a safe and a secure environment. Okay, there's tons of research to support that, but every one of us here tonight, we know that from common sense. So we have a long history of working with our first responders, our folks in the buildings. We have structured ourselves in learning support teams to maximize our ability to develop relationships with students and parents. And if we go back to what I mentioned at the start tonight, as our colleagues would tell us, the number one factor is to develop relationships with students because when we have those relationships, they'll walk up to John or Tom in the hallway or one of the deans or a teacher and say, you know what, something's amiss today. And when they do that, then we have the opportunity to intervene in the building and if necessary with our first responders. So uh, I wanna finish by thanking our Board of Education. Uh, we've uh, got several new members on the board this year, uh, but they have been tremendously supportive. But our boards over a period of time, I've been in the district 13 years, whenever we've come to our board with a plan to enhance our security, our board has listened, they've asked good questions, and they've supported us. And we could evidence that by the expenditure of several million dollars over the last few years in technology. We are blessed to be in an area where we have the resources to do that because we have colleagues in other parts of the state who cannot afford uh, to do uh, those kind of security upgrades. So um, Pat, um, all of you on the board, we wanna thank you for your continued support of what we do here. And we're going to continue to do everything possible to make sure that our students and our staff and our parents who may be, be visiting the building are safe uh, while they're in the building. So with that, I'm going to kind of ask the first question that's topical right now, if you don't mind, Pat. Okay, and uh, we have some of our law enforcement people here with us today. So the president has recommended that teachers be armed in the buildings. Could you guys respond to that? Would, would you be willing to take a crack at that? whether you think that's a good idea or not. Can you hear me okay here? Or do I need to go to the mic? I'm happy. So let, let me just start by uh, thanking Dr. Lee and, and the board for inviting them. I'm relatively new to the community in, in, uh, in the Vernon Hills Police Department, but I've been very impressed with the work that the school board and the administrators at both uh, Vernon Hills and Libertyville High School have done uh, since I've been here. So the question is, is um, I, I think a broader question, and how I like to respond to this, I've been asked this probably, I'm sure Chief Perdigan has, probably 10 times, my neighbor of the fence tonight at, at dinner, so at least 10 times in the last couple of days. It's very hard to discuss these things in very broad strokes. I don't want to speak for a chief of police or for a community that might have one sheriff's officer to respond and they might be a hundred square miles of a rural community. There might be a solution there for that community. So it's very hard to say yes, no, black, white on all of these. Um, the relationships we have with uh, our high school, with District 128, um, layers of security, what you've heard, relationships, very quick response of our emergency, uh, both police and fire. Our officers are trained and equipped. It's Chief Hurtigan's and I's expectation they will go in and address any threat uh, that comes to our community. Uh, I do not see that there's a need in our community to bring additional armed civilian personnel uh, into the community. So to answer your question, no, that's not needed here. Clint, you want to add anything to that, or is that good? Uh, not necessarily. I, I just want to add, and I, I think um, all of us might imagine that it's difficult, even in the law enforcement world, for us to um, screen and recruit and uh, identify appropriate personalities that are not only willing to carry a weapon, but to learn how to use it effectively and engage when appropriate. And so I know that screening process doesn't take place in, in the teacher arena. However, 
you're screening for different uh, reasons uh, for educators. And so um, a broad stroke of the brush like that to suggest that all teachers, teachers should be armed, I, I wouldn't necessarily support that, especially in an area like this where uh, we feel you know, blessed to have the resources that you can provide for us and uh, the agencies and local law enforcement here is, is ready to respond and equip. Great, thank you mm -hmm. to, to respond to that very topical question. Okay, so, let's open up to the board for some questions. I'll ask a couple, maybe before you guys sit down. Um, the, fir the, the, the first one I'm going to ask, I don't, I'm not expecting an answer tonight because we'll probably be here until tomorrow, but um, I would like, uh, on behalf of the board, to, to really um, make a commitment that says we'd always like to know what else we need to do. Um, you know, I'm sure there's always more. Um, you know, at a minimum, I'm sure there's more training we can do. Um, but I'd really like to continue that dialogue. A lot of times when I work with teams at work, I tell the team, it's not the team's decision to say no. Um, decisions of no, I believe, strongly need to be elevated at least one level so that somebody else is involved in that conversation. And I, I would really just um, sort of appeal to you guys, uh, any and everything that you think can and should be done, um, I'd love to make sure that you know Prentice and his team are involved in that. And, and that somehow we're, we're informed of it because the thing that keeps me up at night with all the great stuff that we're doing, and I do believe it's great, I keep scratching my head saying, what are we missing? What else can we do? I know nothing's perfect, um, but I think this is one topic that we got to continue to push the envelope and just keep asking that question because the other thing I, I worry a lot about is complacency. Um, you know, most of us probably walk around thinking not in Vernon Hills, <laughs> not in Libertyville. Um, but it doesn't. It only takes one afternoon to change that, that, that for life. So I, I really want to challenge us to never be complacent. I, I think we've got some good technology, but if you still leave the, lock, the door open, someone's going to get in. Um, so I want to make sure we're vigilant. The other, just one quick question really is, what, what opportunities are out there to benchmark? And, and, and where do you go for, you know, I'll call it state-of-the-art best practices in this space? I, you know, I don't want to appear, um, uh, you know, overconfident. Uh, I just suggest if you look at uh, the fire chiefs in the room, uh, Clint Hurtig and myself, uh, we've probably got 100 years experience. Uh, and it's something that uh, Clint, Clint and I have worked together for, for years, even before we were both chiefs here in our other communities. It's something near and dear to our heart. We, we work very hard. We've spent a lot of our career helping prepare police officers um, and not just that first response but the follow-on response the critical incident management and then the integration with whoever we are working with in this case the school the school administration um, uh, fire ems it really is a team approach we step back from that to your point the training we're never done training we're never done uh, preparing we have a lot of lessons to learn every time uh, an incident happened you know, lessons come of that. We constantly challenge ourselves. We have some terrific instructors on both of our departments. And regionally, the partnership we have in Northern Illinois is second to none. There, there's no one in law enforcement that is blessed like we are in Northern Illinois with the cooperatives we have um, to make sure that it's not just your Libertyville uh, police officers, your Vernon Hills police officers. If we have a tragedy, uh, or some threat come to our community, we'll have a hundred different law enforcement agencies respond in a very organized uh, manner. So uh, we're, we're well prepared, we're constantly learning and, and making us better, um, but I don't think you can look at somewhere in the country and say we're striving to be like them. We truly are prepared uh, and cutting edge. Chief? Yeah, I, I just want to I want to congratulate you on uh, the commitment to, of resources here in District 128, not only in personnel and staff and teams that you're building, but the equipment that you're providing, the technology that you're providing. Um, you, are setting, you are setting the example for others to follow. So um, when, when you're saying you want to guard against complacency, we all do. And we are meeting with your respective school staffs on a, a regular and routine uh, basis to have discussion and open dialogue about best practices that are being identified elsewhere throughout the nation, and in some cases throughout the world. So uh, we're not afraid to put anything on the table, but we think um, 
you know, and we're always learning. There's always room for improvement. We're not afraid of that. I don't want to feel, uh, represent ourselves as arrogant about what's happening here or taking place uh, in our communities, but you are setting the standard and an example for others to follow. Okay, if, if I could, Doctor, yeah. I, I mentioned that I'm relatively new. Uh, I'm sure your principals at Vernon Hill maybe were a little taken aback on the first drill when I asked them to invite some of my colleagues from uh, outside of the area to come see the uh, lockdown and see the technology and some of the physical improvements uh, we've made on campus here at Libertyville and Vernon Hills, they truly are state of the art. And, and I was proud to show it off That's to great. other first responders. That's great. All right, anybody else? I do, I have a question. Thank you all, first of all, for, for all you're doing and, and have done and are continuing to do. Um, as I sit here, it's come to me that, boy, we certainly seem like we have a lot focused on the school day. But I was just thinking, well, what about now? Like, what are we, what kinds of things are in place for all the things that go on, you know, board meetings and school, kids are, this building, these, both these buildings are used constantly for many school activities as well as community activities. And I'm sure there are things in place. I just, it occurred to me as, as we were all sitting here in this room, um, what about as we move into the time that isn't the school day? And, and is that something we should be well, moral, working toward, moral, or I'm sure there already are not, things. Not but. as defined, mm -hmm. but we have the same tools, um, you know, in place, but not in the numbers that we do. I mean, like the doors are, school. you know, like tonight, anybody can walk in and presumably, I don't in know. In the back door, but we do have yeah. somebody monitoring the cameras. Uh -huh. Oh, come yeah, in. even though they're not sitting yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, so the cameras yes. are always monitored. Did you ever? The, ca the cameras are always monitored. They can be monitored, you Just know, from a different location. If different locations, yeah, yeah. they can be monitored from, um, phones and computers from other people at school and we we constantly are looking at our you know procedures in place whether it's big events whether it's big fine arts right. events athletic events um, and we kind of talked about that a little bit last week on some of those things or even off nights but we do have security in place uh, here until um, so we close down the building each evening we also have expanded our security staff somebody at the uh, desk uh, throughout the weekends too on Saturdays and on Sundays. So. And is it, would it be pretty difficult to, for someone who's here, like particularly at a time when it's a non-school hours, to come in um, e easily but then conceal themselves somewhere in the building or is that, I mean you talked about people monitoring restrooms and other places during the day. And so it's still, <laughs> it's, it's it, got to be tricky. It's tough to, uh, with yeah. the, the, the amount of cameras in the school, I think it that would, would be, be hard tough to, to do and the way they're monitored and and we have three shifts and of, I'm we have sure you have other things that we don't, we yeah. We have three shifts of custodians as well. Mm -hmm. So the building is never really completely, yeah. like, So empty. if there's movement or something yeah. that's so unusual, So we have custodians who work the third shift. Yeah. We have people in the building who are around the building who are doing their daily runs, mm -hmm. you know, making sure everything's ready to go for the next day. Um, so, um, <coughs> Yeah, thanks. It just yeah. as we're Tina. sitting here, I thought, oh, yeah. Tina's got a couple of comments. I can just answer that real quick. Uh -huh. Our uh -huh. building, yeah. I can't, I can't speak for LHS, but at our building, um, I have a log sheet roster on a spreadsheet. Every room is checked. Every mm. Bob's wife is checked. Every bathroom is checked. Every teacher's workroom is checked. Main office, administrative ends by the LST and the nurses. They're checked. The security person that checked it puts the time on. Mm. I can verify that time on my cameras, so to make sure everything is copacetic. So, and that's turned in every single night before the building goes into a complete right. lockdown. Thank Great. you. That's uh -huh. really good. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Other questions? Anybody else? First off, I want to begin by. Um, thanking everyone who came and participated in this. I think the size of this team here speaks volumes to uh, what is going on in terms of a holistic approach to this issue. Um, the first thing I was wondering, could someone just briefly go over the trainings that the security guards at the school face when they are hired or the continuous training that they're subjected to? Again, Bob Bulix from Libertyville. Um, I can speak for my staff. Uh, I have three retired deputy police chiefs that work for me, so we've been doing this a long time as well as I have. When we developed a lot of this, um, what we try to do is uh, anytime uh, there's a lot of classes that are offered, 
if there's a seminar at CLC, we'll try to send people there. But um, every Wednesday, we try to sit down and meet and we'll talk about, we'll do in-house training. We try to use our experience that we have. Um, and everybody is very versed at the procedures. And I think that's one of the things we focus on. So we're always looking for new training opportunities. The district's always been very generous. Uh, if someone applies to you know, go to a training session, um, but a lot of it is done in-house on how to use our systems and, and uh, report anything, uh, the main thing. <coughs> Thank you. And then um, second, could maybe one of the LST staffs, could you walk me, say, when a, say a student tonight submits a bullying issue, how does that process unfold moving forward? I'll, I'll do the first part and then I'll turn it over to Jason. So if somebody submits something online, you can access it from either of the websites and it automatically sends emails to key personnel. And I'm one of those key, uh, people that get uh, an email that it's been submitted um, and the other people will get notification that it's been submitted. But I'll also follow up to, you know, uh, whether it's at Libertyville or Vernon Hills and follow up with those people immediately, whether it's uh, Greg Stilling or Jack <coughs> William at the buildings at Vernon Hills or uh, Eric or Tom here at uh, Libertyville. So even though I know they may be getting some of those notifications, I'll still follow up with them right away on that. And then once we get those, then the LST maybe will be working alongside. Yeah, if we do receive a report, um, it's shared through us, we have it. We sit down and we meet as a team and go through the report to kind of collect information. What's this about? What's it look like? Who's the student involved? Because just uh, like we were saying, our LSTs, the learning support teams, are divided up by alpha slice. So maybe um, I have a student that's involved along with Megan, so her and I will work through the situation and get uh, together. But even before that, we collect as much information as possible from the report. We sit down, come up with a game plan, and then follow through typically uh, would have to do with uh, sitting down with the students and trying to work through it to see if what's on here is exactly what happened, if it's all matching up, but then bringing the parents in as well and trying to close that loop. Um, and as you could imagine, it could be anything that you receive a report on. It could be something that you could bring the SRO in. Maybe we think there's a crime there. Maybe it's not that level at all. Maybe it's too uh, friends who aren't getting along at lunch. So collect the information sent out as a team, come up with a game plan, and then follow through with that game plan. Working through with the students, working through with the parents, working through with wh whoever uh, is involved, um, and trying to just fix and repair that situation so we can move forward. Does that help answer that? Yeah, thank question? you very much. Okay. Just to extend that um, one step further, and I uh, several people have uh, touched on this uh, tonight, but, but Matt, to take your question a little further. Let's say we get a, bull a bullying harassment report that actually says, you know, I, I overheard a, a student or I saw a social media report tonight that somebody was going to do something bad to the school. Okay, so immediately Brian would start getting a hold of folks. He would contact me. We would start contacting people at, at whatever building it was involved in. And then at some level, we're going to be working with our first responders to do a threat assessment. Okay? And that's really important because they have significant experience in terms of doing that. So we're going to lean heavily on their work with us in terms of assessing that threat to see what the information is and uh, running out any appropriate uh, ground balls. A good example of that just happened at Mundelein High School next door. Okay, and uh, first responders did a great job with the school. I think they have found the individuals that were responsible, um, and uh, they will be held accountable for that. There probably wasn't really a threat, but you cannot make those kind of threats. But that would be an example of, of a follow through. But our work with the first responders on a threat at that level, okay, is going to be right from the beginning, and it's going to be leaning on their expertise heavily along with the relationships we have and knowledge of our students. And putting that, as Jason said, putting that information together, collecting that information, and working with them side by side until we bring that to some resolution. And that's a really key component. That uh, component, that threat assessment piece, is a very important component of that process. That help? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, how about we give you guys a round of Great job. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. You have some questions in the crowd? Oh. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, and okay. maybe the police officers can. Microphone. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> For the people who watch it on video, that way they can hear your question. Okay, thank you for arranging all of this. Uh, my name is Jim Connell, and my question maybe is for the police officers. And um, what's been on my mind, in terms of a question that keeps coming up in my mind, um, especially after the Parkland incident um, shooting, is if a child or a parent or a teacher or anybody reports if there's if there's kids or, or people that are have bad behavior or erratic they're holding guns to their siblings heads and they're doing all kinds of crazy things that are getting reported to police law enforcement FBI whoever it might be I'm, I'm trying to figure out why uh, what can be done? Is it is nothing done because of um, the fact that they haven't brought broke the law? Like for example, if somebody's doing weird things and saying weird things, they're not necessarily breaking the law, right? So my question is, what can be done? You know, if we're all sit, uh, see something, share something. <coughs> Um, how, how does that get elevated? I don't know the law that well. I don't know how, how it works. But it's baffling to me, without getting too specific in terms of the Parkland thing, but it's baffling to me that this behavior of this person was so crazy and out of control and kind of in, I, I absolutely insane. <coughs> but, but the question I kept coming up was, well, why didn't somebody haul him in? But then... The other side of me is going, well, he probably didn't break the law. So you can't just haul people in, but see something, share something, it kind of defeats it. So I, I just don't understand. And I, I'm looking for maybe an explanation or some context. So thank you. You're welcome. So see something, share something is extremely important, right? We don't want, well, first of all, I'm, we aren't going to pass judgment on what happened in Florida. We don't know all of the details yet. Uh, we won't be ready to comment on that particular situation until a final report is uh, <laughs> provided. However, I will assure you, uh, in, a scenario, in the scenarios like you're describing, it's not that nothing is done uh, in our communities. What we would do in an environment where maybe a crime was not committed and the person is not arrested and brought in immediately, is we work with uh, that person and family members or friends to bring either them to social services uh, to get some immediate assistance, or we bring the social services to them. So it's not that nothing is done. Maybe we can't make an arrest at that particular time, but we'll work in that type of an environment to make sure that information is gathered, the uh, a documentation occurs about the incident and the concerns that were related to us, and there's follow-up done uh, to the extent that we can, and we'll work not only with the school in the type of scenario that you're describing, but even outside of the school environment, to bring social services either to them or them to the social services. Right. Hey, let me just add one more comment or thought to Chief Hurtigan's uh, uh, points there is uh, we, we also have in Illinois, uh, I feel very fortunate to be a police officer uh, with the system we have uh, regarding firearms is called the Firearms Owner Identification Card Act. It's been in, in force for a long time. It's been enhanced in recent years and even when someone doesn't commit a crime, if their behavior is uh, erratic and there's other things that demonstrate they might be a danger, there's a mechanism as police officers that um, we can put in place to have their uh, rights to uh, buy or possess a firearm suspended until they go through some due process to figure out what's really behind it. So we really do have some, uh, some powerful uh, laws in Illinois to help, and I think that really gets to some of your concerns as well. We don't have to necessarily arrest. There are other steps we can do. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. We really appreciate it. Oh. Oh. I have one more comment. Anna Dry, 1020 Ashley Lang. 
Um, this didn't happen in our community, thank God, uh, but it certainly does affect our students. Um, as a parent, I'm deeply grateful to see all the resources that are being used. I also want to give specific thanks to LHS. Um, our students are affected and they're trying to process this and a part of this process they have very important voices and I'm just really grateful that you guys are giving those students a safe opportunity during some upcoming events to uh, be able to, to voice their opinions and to, to be moved to action. You know the greatest predictor of future behavior is current behavior and you're turning them into good citizens by giving them the opportunity. Thank you so much. Okay, you good? Good. All right, okay, I'm gonna let you get started. I'll be right back. Yeah, uh, okay, thanks again, uh, everybody. I appreciate your help. All right, um, student school board reps, who would like to go first? So, as we've heard, um, our district is very invested in student safety. Um, and Dr. Gilliam had just reiterated to some students that he's totally willing to talk to us if we want to participate in walkouts or any other measures that we need to take in order to ensure our own safety. Moving forward, One Act was on the 15th and 16th and they performed the play Love Is. Um, the shows were about types of love, figuring out who you are, to finding your place in a waiting room, to family, to an underdog at, at a New Year's party. There was something for everyone. Um, in addition, there was the Winter Band Concert last Tuesday with senior soloist Drake DeBoer and the Winter Orchestra Concert last Thursday with senior soloist Tim Lee. Calvin Yoon set the school record for <coughs> 100 fly at sectionals and competed at the IHS IHSA State Final Swim Meet last Friday. Blake Teschke qualified in the wrestling tournament for a state on February 15th. And a, another congratulations to the dance team for their ninth place finish at the IHSA State Finals and the cheer team as well for finishing 12th at the IHSA State Cheer Finals. We had a couple national merit finalists from VHHS specifically was Felicia E, Theodore Chen, Hayden Lau, Nico Montani, Anmol Parande, and Kevin Yoon. We have also launched a new initiative called the VH Day, VH Day of Service, which will be on April 10th this year, and we launched a sign up for that. We had 300 students sign up within six minutes when we first launched that, so that makes all of our volunteer spots full. Um, and then we'll update you on that further progress of that on our April meeting. Everyone is also very excited to spread the spirit of VH Give throughout the community. So we also have a new school logo. A group of staff and students worked with local artists to create a new branding image for our school because we realized that we had different logos for all of our different student activities. Um, the Vernon Hills History Bowl team placed fifth at the state tournament, qualifying for the national tournament to be held in Washington, D.C., and some members also qualified in individual competitions. Senior Albert Munchik's photo was selected as one of the top 20 works in the 2018 Illinois High School Art <coughs> Exhibit. The IHSAE selects 20 works to represent the power of visual arts and student development and educational experiences in Illinois so Albert's photo will become part of an annual traveling ex exhibition. And Blick Art Materials is funding professional, professional framing of the work. The WISE team brought home the first place trophy at the regional tournament this weekend. The team did an outstanding job at their first level of competition, which was held at CLC on Saturday. The team advanced to the sectional meet held here at Vernon Hills, or at Vernon Hills on March 6th. 99 FBLA students participated in the area competition at Wakanda High School on January 28th, and 81 placed and qualified for the state competition in April. And like we saw, congratulations to senior Jordan Bunning, who was selected to the IHSA All-State Academic Team. In LHS news, um, this past Friday, Dr. K took a group of five students, including myself and some LHS staff, to visit some local high schools, so New Trier, Stevenson, and Glenbrook High Schools, to view some of their student spaces, such as their libraries and their Project Lead the Way spaces. And the goal of the field trip was to take notes of what really made each space collaborative and engaging for students and like heighten the learning environment and see what we can bring to LHS for stuff as simple as just new furniture or redesigning entire spaces to make them more engaging for students. Um, in fine arts news, we have a lot. 
Um, freshman and sophomore put on Love Sick on January 26th to 20, 25th to 26th. And then also, I just presented the winter play Bly Spirit on February 15th to 17th. LHS Jazz Groups received number one ratings in the North Shore Jazz Festival, which is the best they can get. And then also, LHS Bands had their winter concert this last Wednesday, orchestra has theirs this Wednesday, and then choir will be next Wednesday. Um, in athletics, our Palm team finished up their season by competing at state. Um, LHS senior Dylan Boyle received fifth place, and sophomore Maggie Koberstein received sixth place at the varsity championship for fencing. And then Joy Bissing and Jackson Padden qualified for the National Ice Fishing Championship. They are sophomores. And then our boys varsity basketball team was co-conference champions. And then many of our spring sports started today. Lastly for me is our, one of our seniors, Sophie Richardson, who is president of NHS is a candidate for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Student of the Year campaign. She's been fundraising to help patients get access to treatments for blood cancer. Her fundraising began February 4th and she has about four weeks remaining to reach her goal of $10,000. All right, so LHS had their turnabout dance on February 10th. Due to the snow day on February 9th, the turnabout assembly had to be rescheduled to February 14th. Um, but it was still a lot of fun. LHS's own student band, Fun Monkey, performed at the assembly, and Anton Alesna was crowned king of the dance. The theme for the whole week um, was Winter Olympics, so students enjoyed a lot of activities leading up to the dance that were a lot of fun. Um, seniors Miriam Tolba and Katie Lund received honorable mentions in the National Center for Women in Information Technology Award for Aspirations in Computing. Weistein placed second at the Illinois Academic Regional Competition at the College of Lake County on February 3rd. The team was led by senior Albert Sue, who actually received first place in chemistry and second place in English. Um, Sue was also named the team's most valuable player that weekend. Uh, junior Thomas Pearson, who we mentioned at our previous meeting in January, was announced the winner of the Voice of Democracy State competition on February 10th, and will have the opportunity to travel to Washington, D.C. for the national competition, um, where he, amongst the other uh, 53 finalists, will compete for a $30,000 scholarship. Um, LHS hosted an event on Thursday, February 9th, um, to get seniors and um, juniors to register to vote for the upcoming midterm elections in November. Um, all students who registered to vote at this event were entered into um, a raffle for the chance to win a signed Hamilton poster by LHS alumni Pippa Sue. Um, and senior Sammy Storch was the uh, lucky winner of this poster. Um, this past Saturday, LHS's Best Buddies welcomed members from the community um, for the school's local carnival, or for the school's annual ca carnival. Um, students with special needs had an absolute blast as they were able to go around to different carnival booths for um, games, face paints, and like bounty houses. Uh, as a whole, um, I'm president of this club, so uh, we saw more people in attendance than we have in um, years past, and it's just really cool to see other members from the community who aren't usually exposed to Best Buddies. Um, just kind of see what we as a club are all about. Um, this week in addition, Best Buddies is also sponsoring a Spread the Word to End the Word campaign, which is a week here at LHS devoted to bringing awareness to students at LHS d with disabilities, um, also focusing on educating students, specifically why it's inappropriate to use our word here. Um, this week as well, LHS, LHS's International Language Department is putting on International Language Week. Throughout the week, students will be able to experience different cultures um, through food items being sold outside the cafeteria. So we've got chips and guacamole, uh, chocolate croissants, and churros, um, along with a lot of other fun activities planned by the department. Thank you. Good job, Chris. Thanks for your help. You guys are free yes. to go. Yeah, would you like to go home now? <laughs> Thank you. If you have any difficulty at school tomorrow waking up, then, then you know, between Dr. Kalentis and Dr. Gilliam and I, we'll make sure you're taken care of. Okay? Thank you. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that's on the meat pack. Yes. Okay, uh, superintendent's report. Uh, believe it or not, we say this every month, but there's actually more good news to share uh, tonight, which is always uh, very cool. All 16 of D128's National Merit candidates have been chosen as finalists 
Congratulations to the following LHS and VHHS seniors as they advance now in the competition. From LHS, Aaron Chen, uh, Kathleen Lund, Colin Miller, Julia Mullenhauer, Suraj uh, Rajendran, Emily Roller, Emily Stone, Albert Sue, Allison Tong, and Laura Zhang. From VHHS, Theodore Chen, Felicia um, E, Hayden Lau, uh, Nikal Man Manganani, uh, Anma Parande, and Kevin Yoon. The following VHHS students were named recipients of the Ellen Swick Cougar Class Act Award for February. Zach Estelle, Sam Wolf, Damian Valenzuela, Jonathan Wallach, Vincent Roberts, Luke Gudmanson, uh, Avery Longdon, Megan Kavalik, Courtney Hib Himley, uh, Hebe Yosef, Jefferson Diaz, and Michael Hardy. The following LHS students were named LHS February Students of the Month, Maggie Hutchins, Elizabeth Manley, Luke Underwood, Matthew Johnson, Larkin Haverty Dennis, uh, Jalen Pitts, Gracie Benson, and Ellie Sorensen. Um, the BHHS math team won first place at last Saturday's regional competition at Stevenson High School. The team will compete at the state tournament at the University of Illinois in May. The LHS mathematics team finished in second place at their regional math contest at Stevenson High School on Saturday. In addition to team and individual honors, John He was the individual regional champion in sophomore geometry. The LHS mock trial team had a strong performance at the Lake County Invitational on Saturday. Cecilia Snyder, uh, Lancey Marcos, and Annie Ryan won Best Witness Award. And the LHS fishing team sophomore member, let me say that again, the LHS fishing team, okay, we do have fishing teams at both schools, we like that. Um, sophomore members Joey Bissing and Jackson Payton competed in the NAIFC ice fishing tournament held on Channel Lake in Antioch on February 4th with great results. The team braved brutally cold conditions to catch a limit of bluegill and crappy that weighed 5.13 pounds, earning them first place among all high school teams. The team finished 21 first overall in the mostly adult field of 43 teams. The national championship will be held in December 14th and 15th in Natawash, Minnesota. I think I'm close there. Okay, so congratulations. Uh, 12 DE 128 art students had work selected for display at the Illinois High School Art Exhibition, IHSA. <coughs> Their artwork was chosen from a select group of 25 pieces representing <coughs> VHHS artists submitted for judging to this annual exhibit. From VHHS, Zara Nadim, Senior Portfolio Scholarship recipient, Eldana Satmakulova, uh, Mixed Media, uh, Anya K. Poles in drawing, Drew Laser in printing, uh, Anya K. Poles for Senior Portfolio Scholarship recipient, Sarah Abdullah for sculpture, and Albert Modricks for photography. From LHS, Shannon Long in drawing, Hannah Miller in sculpture, Nate Schweitzer in design, Jillian Vang in painting, and Emma Muller in ceramics. Additionally, a photo uh, by VHHS senior Albert Modric was selected as one of the top 20 works in the exhibit. The IHSAE selected 20 works to represent the power of visual arts and student development and educational experiences in Illinois. Albert's photo will become part of an annual traveling exhibition being exhibited at such venues as the Illinois Association of School Boards and Administrators Convention, the Illinois State Capitol Building, and Soho House in Chicago. The District 128 Special Olympians brought home a total of one gold, seven silvers, three bronze, and two fourth place ribbons at this year's Winter Games held earlier this month in Galena. Medal winners were Alex Aquinda uh, was gold in the 100 meter, Nathan Ferreira was silver in the 4x100 relay, silver in the 100 meter, and bronze in the 200 meter. Anthony Berthold was silver in the 4x100 relay, and silver in the 200 meter. Joseph Mahler was silver in the 4x100 relay and silver in the 200 meter. And Eric Catterline was silver in the 4x100 uh, relay and fourth in the 200 meter. Shaw Karanen finished fourth in the 100 meter. And Tristan Hidalgo finished uh, with a bronze in the 100 meter and a bronze in the 50 meter. So congratulations to all of those students for their outstanding 
achievements. Certainly proud of all of them. Okay, next up on the superintendent's report is uh, the LHS swimming pool project update. So, Mark and Dan. Thank you. Uh, well, after um, our winter conditions, uh, we started to uh, uh, move forward this week with some good weather and uh, start to uh, make some progress. Um, over the last few weeks, uh, we finished up uh, phase one with uh, water main, uh, sanitary, and storm line ins installation. Um, they, um, we presently um, uh, are 60% 60 60 complete on our under pool piping, uh, which started up again um, uh, on Monday. Um, and uh, we are digging for uh, foundation walls along the north side to start footings in that area. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so like we talked about a committee, there's the financial report there for you. So that hasn't changed because that was two weeks ago and it's still the information. So all, all the financial information you'll essentially get will always be a, one month in arrears. So in February, you'll get the data that includes January. Um, and so even our report to date, there's no change orders, but I do want to just let you know that um, to either tonight or tomorrow we'll be getting two change orders uh, for us that we're going to move forward with. Both of the, One of them elevates to uh, Dr. Lee's level for approval and the other one is at my level for approval. And just for review, based on the contract, that was a level of up to 25000 or they're like really twenty four ninety nine or something like that is is at my level and up to up to forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine is uh, Dr. Lee's and anything above that would have to go to the board uh, for approval and so just to let you know we haven't signed those yet but we have we haven't actually got them yet to sign but the first one and Mark can fill in the details of, of what they are but the first one is related to uh, the electric line that goes um, under that was going to that is currently there uh, it's going to be going under the the parking lot that is immediately west of the of the built of the pool structure. Um, when they were designing it and everything, they had an assumption of how low, how deep that that was. When they actually dug it out, they realized it was it was too shallow. It was shallower than they thought. So that ha that has to that conduit has to get relayed, uh, re kind of put in the ground at a deeper level so that we don't have any problems when we're putting the parking lot on top of that. Now that we kind of found out about this, what we're doing is taking the opportunity to try to future-proof this as well, and so we're also moving it a bit uh, so that anything else that we might do on the west side of that building, it won't have any impact in the future. So anything you want to add? That one will probably be at the level of around 40,000, but we don't know. And um, so I'll just explain the other one. Uh, the other one is briefly just related to, he'll explain, but essentially we have to dig out some uh, saturated soil uh, in, in our in the deep end of the pool that's kind of happened there. He can explain that. That will be probably um, not quite 10,000, less than that or something like that. So uh, we're, we have a $530,000 contingency, so this will eat into that a bit, uh, but we still well have plenty of contingency left. But Mark, do you want to explain a little bit more of any of the that I'm Yes, the concept of muck. Um, Yes, the second item um, has been phrased as muck. Uh, so what transpired was um, we were in winter conditions. We had the blankets down, plastic down, and um, so we weren't getting the frost, so we were moving ahead with our underground piping and pouring concrete and all that, keep frost out of the ground. Um, after the last snows and the, and the rains and everything melted, um, water got underneath the tarps and in some areas. It super saturated the the soils, so we have to remove those soils, uh, uh, scrape that muck layer off, as we call it, uh, between two and four inches of it. Um, so we, and then we will uh, haul in gravel to fill up for that void, um, and then the rest of the gravel can go in the base of the pool, so we can start pouring uh, the bottom of the pool. Um, on the electric line, uh, we, as Dan said, we are trying to future-proof it. Um, more or less like we did with our gas main years ago. So we will be running the electric line parallel uh, to our gas line, which runs back to our, our HVAC plant. Um, that line that is uh, 
not deep enough in the parking lot actually only supplies electricity to our plant, which uh, provides us heat uh, in the winter and uh, air conditioning in the summer. So uh, it is a critical line. So we will we will move that into our 50 foot uh, setback from property line, along, and it'll be there with the gas line. Uh, uh, so it'll be out of the way for any future developments. So the upgrade is it won't be it won't be sitting under a parking lot. So in the future, if we have to get to that line, we have uh, access to that line. So uh, just to quickly go through process again, we told uh, when we discussed these, as Dan has already been reviewed, we put some checks and balances in place. Um, I said at that time that even on the lower change orders that Mark and Dan would be talking with me. That's just because how we do things. Uh, how we work together uh, collaboratively in the office. So we've had some discussions about both um, projects, um, certainly supportive, um, and uh, we need to say, uh, sign the change order so we can move uh, forward with um, the work. So, um, you know, unless I, you have any objections, you know, we will do that. Uh, Dan will, will sign the one I'm aware of, the lower one. 10,000-ish, and uh, I'll sign the one that's uh, around $40,000. And we'll do a report out once we get the work done and what the final cost is. Sound like a plan? Okay. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, next on the docket is we are pleased to announce after uh, a rigorous um, search and interview process that we are ready to hire the new athletic director at Libertyville High School. Um, you will recall that one of the reasons is that we need a new athletic director at Libertyville High School is because uh, we hired Bryant as the associate superintendent uh, toward the end of last year. Uh, we've had two phenomenal um, retired um, athletic directors and individuals doing that job this year. They've done a wonderful job in keeping things moving forward. Uh, but we're excited tonight uh, to recommend the hiring of uh, John Woods as athletic director. And Tom, you just want to give us a quick thumb, thumbnail again because we've had some conversation with the board regarding John. Um, yes, so we are um, uh, extremely excited at Libertyville High School to recommend to you um, the hiring of John Woods as our athletic director. Um, since 2008, he's been the assistant principal for activities and facilities at Champaign Central High School. Um, and he's been an athletic director since 2003. In his current role, he supervises 21 sports and 57 activities. He schedules the building's facilities, he organizes their master calendar, and he also serves as their director of special education. Um, he evaluates approximately 60 coaches and conducts formal evaluations for certified and non-certified and custodial staff. Um, as an athletic director, he's highly active in the Illinois Athletic Directors Association. He served as their president from 2015 to 2017, and he's currently serving as its treasurer. This is the organization of all the athletic directors in the state of Illinois, so it gives him tremendous uh, knowledge of other athletic programs and contacts in networks throughout the state. Um, he was uh, the 2015 <coughs> Athletic Director of the Year for his uh, area um, in the state of Illinois, um, which is a really big deal. Um, he's also a National Interscholastic Athletic Administrator Association Leadership Training Institute instructor. A lot of words there, but that means he leads uh, professional development sessions throughout the state on leadership, athletic program development at high schools, and student wellness for coaches and athletic administrators. Um, what we really <coughs> found with John, though, and among all of his professional accolades and accomplishments, he is a tremendously personable, charismatic, relationship-centered person who leads um, very much as a servant leader. His principal, his current principal, called him the best AD in the state and one of the top in the nation. Um, his uh, district director, his associate superintendent district director, um, told us that he creates great relationships with parents, students, and coworkers, that he reaches out to all members of his community. Um, and uh, our hiring team, our students, staff, um, and administrative team, um, were just really impressed with John's ability to take 
core values of an institution and transform an athletic program so that every aspect of that athletic program reflects those core values. Um, so we feel that we are bringing to you as a board one of the top athletic directors in the state of Illinois, and um, we are um, very excited to recommend him to you for hire. Okay. Okay. So we will uh, need a motion. Uh, second. Any discussion and a vote? Okay. Is there a motion to appoint um, LHS Director John Woods effective July 1st, 2018? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? No? If not, roll call, please. Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next on the superintendent's report is 2017-2018 amended school calendar. Uh, under current uh, Illinois rules and regs, when we uh, have an emergency day off of school, uh, we have to uh, amend the calendar. As the board is aware, uh, we have more student attendance days than uh, virtually any other school in the state. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, when we have to take a day off, we do not have to add a day on the end of the year or take a day off uh, from spring break or anything like that. However, we do have to submit an amended school calendar, which would indicate that uh, we had a snow day, um, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago or a week and a half ago or so. So um, anyway, uh, again, this is just a required function of what uh, we would have to do if we're uh, fortunate enough to get out of the rest of winter and early spring with no more um, bad uh, inclement conditions, and this will be our calendar if we have to take another day off at some point for inclement weather then that month that we take the date off, we'll be back with another amended school calendar, okay? So we would need, uh, again, a motion and a second. Yeah, and I make a motion that we accept the amended school calendar as presented. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Huber? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Rudy? Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had three uh, FOIA requests uh, since the last <coughs> board meeting. Uh, the first request is on 123.18 from Emily Coleman, the Lake uh, County News, uh, excuse me, Sun Tribune Media Group, um, requesting all communication emails between September 5th, uh, 2016, December 31, 2016, to and from Pat uh, Grudy Prentice Lee, Ellen Maurer, Denise Swift that contain the phrases election, petition papers, nominating papers, and signatures. Uh, Brian Kelly did the follow-up, and uh, we responded prior to uh, the deadline. Uh, virtually nothing uh, in that request. On um, 123.18, Emily Coleman again from Lake County News Sun, uh, <coughs> Chicago Tribune Media Group. Um, that looks like oh, that looks like this is a slightly different one. Yeah. So uh, this is a second one. Um, all communication, including emails, between December 27, 2017. In January, 20, uh, January 8, 2018, to and from Prentice Lee, Mary Todrick, Pat Grudy, Ellen Maurer, they contain the phrases Todrick, Daily Herald, um, Herald, Lee Felis, or Husband. Brian Kelly responded to that. Um, and on 2 1, Jim Tyrell from the Prairie State Wire um, requested a copy of our current bargaining agreement data for all employees of CHST 128, represented by any organized labor. Uh, collective bargaining unit including first name, middle name, or initial last name, department, job title, organized labor collective, bargaining unit name, government, email address, school name, and salary. Uh, Dan Stanley and Bryant responded to that in a timely manner. Was that stuff we were able to give? That looked like another one of these fishing things. Uh, yes, uh, because um, this was in the course of their employment, so that's a matter of public record. So we didn't have to create okay. Again, on FOIA requests, we don't have to create a document that we don't have. We don't have to create a brand new spreadsheet. Um, so we uh, had this information in a okay. format that was readily um, doable. Uh, and again, on the other two requests, virtually you know, nothing uh, in terms of to respond to. Okay, uh, so uh, one last thing under superintendent's report under other. Uh, the board has in front of them. You have two donations. Oh, I'm sorry. You've been here too long. Uh, they're in here. Okay, there, you there they are. Um, I apologize. Two uh, doing, doing donations. Uh, the first one from AOK Industries, uh, Mr. Dan Runger. Um, we want to acknowledge um, 
His donation of machinery and equipment to the Applied Tech Department in Libertyville High School is listed below. One Bridgeport mill, one forehead drill press, and one forging uh, oven. So we uh, thank um, AOK Industries. And the next one uh, is from Mr. Greg uh, Gratz in Libertyville. Uh, we want to acknowledge donation of commercial sandblaster to the Applied Tech Department at Libertyville High School. Um, we are um, excited to accept uh, that gift. Okay, now finally in the superintendent's report, the board has in front of it a special gift. So Rita, do you want to tell the board what uh, we have provided them tonight? We've uh, previously shared with the board our process for designing a portrait of a graduate. Um, and that process involved input from almost 300 stakeholders, a writing and design team that carefully looked at the survey data and crafted a message that when we began the process felt very uh, future um, <coughs> focused, um, aspirational, and um, you know the, the, the focus on designing uh, a document that would prepare students for you know what we viewed as a very uncertain future world. Um, we're happy to announce that we officially soft launched what has become our new mission with our staff on Monday. And the theme of that soft launch was the significance of our daring mission in preparing students now for not only the uncertain future that they face, but for the challenging world that the events of the last few weeks uh, indicate that we're living in. And so the words that we've crafted to cre create students who are daring, who are able to discover themselves, their passion, their interests, their own perspectives, um, and to act on those perspectives um, is more immediate and more urgent. And so we're really proud of the words that you've seen previously and the brand new design that we unveiled um, for our students who are dreamers and doers, aware, resilient and healthy, inquisitive, nimble, and global. So we'd like you to unveil that new graphic that was met um, very favorably by the staff who also were issued their uh, diplomas on Monday at our institute day. I'd like to open it up and see our brand new graphic. We also have a sticker for your devices. Fill it up and put it on your nice. Well nice, nice, nice. We will begin tomorrow uh, to form a group that's looking at um, bringing in voices, um, including our student voices as represented through their principles in implementing the mission and connecting our daily work to the language of our daring mission. Okay, great job. Thanks, Rita. Mm -hmm. All right, Pat, uh, that uh, completes the superintendent's okay. report. Thank you very much. All right, the consent vote agenda is listed. We reviewed it earlier in the month. If I could ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Gertie? Aye. Huber? Aye. Motion carries. All right, program and personnel, Chairperson Maurer. Okay, we just have a few things. Um, board, we have board policies for second reading and adoption. We have policy 4110, transportation. Uh, policy 590, abused and neglected child reporting. Policy 5220, substitute teachers. Policy 650, school wellness. And policy 7250, student support services. There have been no changes since the last reading. So we're looking for a motion to accept those as presented. <coughs> So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Gertie? Aye. Huber? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, and then the second item uh, is employment of employees, and we'll get a <coughs> motion to approve those as, as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Thurman? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. All right, motion carries. 
and Thank under you. other, I don't have any others. Okay. Anyone else? All right. And we're done. All right, thank you. Uh, facilities and finance, because uh, since Jim's not here, uh, I guess I'll just turn it right over to you, um, uh, Dan, I guess, right, on the two bits? Yeah, sure. Uh, so really two, two bits to present for you that we presented at the Facilities and Finance Committee meeting. The first is the transportation bid. As you know, uh, one bid received, and that's from Lakeside Transportation. And so we'll recommend to approve that bid. That's a three-year contract uh, with an option to extend for a fourth and a fifth year. Um, well, it, uh, it's not an actual price. They're route rates. Oh, They're listed on all the bids and everything. So I make a motion to approve the Lakeside bid for three years with the option to extend for two. A second. Any discussion? All right, roll call, please. Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. All right, motion carries. And VHAC. Uh, second would be for a motion to accept the um, bid from a, uh, a C. Esatelli heating and piping contractors um, of Ville Park, Illinois, for the uh, Libertyville High School 2018 summer HVAC upgrades. Um, the base bid for the project was $1,130,000. So if we could have a motion to accept that uh, bid. And there's no alternate, right, Mark? For the no reason. alternate? You no want us to accept an alternate? Uh, no, there's no alternate with this project. Okay, all right, so total bid is $1,130,000. I make a motion that we approve the Esatelli um, HVAC contractors bid the amount of $1,130,000 as presented. Second. Any discussion? All right, roll call, please. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Maurer. Aye. Thurman. Aye. Grudy. Aye. All right, motion carries. Any other? Okay, that's it. All right, no property, CEDAW? Um, just as I mentioned last month, we were going to be uh, voting on the recommended new superintendent, which uh, we did, and she was approved, Ms. Val Valerie Donnan. Great. Great background. Thank you. Important job to fill. Mm -hmm. Yes, favorite. All right, anything else? Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, now IASB, again, we're going to move into an executive session. We will not be doing um, item A, we will only be discussing collective negotiating, negotiating matters 5 ILCS 120 2 c 2 So if I could ask for a motion to move into executive session. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Gertie? Aye. Huber? Aye. All right, motion carries. Again, we're not, we will not be taking any further action this evening. Thanks. Good night, everybody.